There we go. <laughs> Does uh, everyone have the example file so far? Anyone still downloading it? OK. Um, I should have sent out an email to everyone who I had emails from as well. So you can also check your email and see if you have the, the zip um, in that too if you're waiting for the thumb drive to come around. Um, and then also, if you have a text external text editor like Sublime or Visual Code, uh, it'd be good to install the GLSL highlighting if you can, or Open GL highlighting. That'll just help a little bit uh, when we start kind of do, writing some of that a little bit later in the workshop. So um, there's a link in the email I sent for a package for uh, Sublime text, and uh, I think if you use a different, you know, editor. Hopefully, you can kind of find find one that works. Um. Hmm. Oh yeah, D does anyone not have that installed? Okay, what? You, okay, so um, if you go, do you, are you running Sublime? Cool. Uh, so the process for installing this is if you are in Sublime text, you press Control Shift P to open uh, package control. And if you haven't installed it, you might need to type in uh, package control first and then it, install it. So you'll see install package control. Um, and then after that, oh, OK. Um, I don't know how to solve that error, though. <laughs> um, but uh, either way, you might be OK without the highlighting. So. It's, it, it's nice, but you'll be able to see it at least on my screen. So if you can get it working, that's that's helpful, but uh, not required, optional. Cool. Control Shift P opens up the kind of console, and then if you type in package, you can you should see install package control, and uh, after you do that, click install package, and then you'll type open GL, and I think I already have it, or yeah. It should show up, but because I already have it installed, it's not showing up here. Um, cool. All right. But everyone else has the, anyone still need the example files? OK. You, oh, and so you can pass this back around. And then you guys, yeah, OK. Cool. All right. Cool. OK. Oh, where did that USB stick go? OK, cool. Sweet. Well, it'll it'll make its way around. Um, I can go ahead and uh, get started, because it looks like we're all here. Can everyone hear me OK? I'm going to try to speak up, because it's a little noisy. So all right, so um, yeah, welcome to this workshop on creating generative visuals with complex systems. Uh, so my name is Simon Alexander Adams. I also make uh, kind of daily posts as Polyhop on Instagram, so you might know my work from there as well. Uh, and I create a lot of uh, what I think f most of it fits within under the umbrella of generative art. You might argue that some doesn't, but the fair, uh, the majority of what I do and what a lot of people do in Touch Designer could be considered generative art, which is, um, I think it's kind of nice to think about this definition. Is uh, so this is just like, you know, Wikipedia, uh, but it's useful on the, all, all the same. Um, so it refers to art that is in whole or in part has been created uh, with the use of an autonomous system. So this is essentially using some kind of algorithm or machine or other system. It doesn't even have to be a computer. It could be a set of rules that removes the decision-making process. It moves it away from the artist to some degree. Um, so you know, it could be anything from like flipping a coin and making a random decision based on that, or uh, using noise and touch designer. All of that fits under this umbrella. Um, so we're going to be making generative art, and the next sort of part of this uh, is complex systems. Um, so this is a really broad topic. It really ranges from everything from like the climate to thinking about organisms, modeling weather, infrastructure, um, cities, ecosystems, cells. Uh, this is all like, you know, very complicated um, systems with uh, basically smaller parts that are kind of like interacting with one another. And they're um, kind of like the result of these smaller components interacting creates something that is complex and 
something that you can't necessarily predict by just looking at the individual components. So there's um, one property that I think is really interesting in uh, complex systems is emergence. So that's, you know, um, property that isn't, in, uh, as I just said, apparent in the kind of smaller components that make up a system. Or uh, if you have a rule for the system, you might not be able to tell what it's actually going to look like just by looking at the um, the rule set. So it, there's something that's kind of unpredictable about it. And uh, one thing that I'm really interested in getting at, and hopefully you find interesting too, is uh, using code to make things that surprise you as the artist. I think that that's where I what I find really rewarding is when um, you know I can make something that I don't expect the results. Uh, and so. Uh, we'll look at two different types of complex systems. One is cellular automata, which um, we'll get into a little bit more deta uh, detail into that later, but it's essentially a simulation using a grid of cells that kind of have um, life and death states. So they are born and they die. Um, so Conway's Game of Life being one of the more famous examples. So we'll look at how to make that, but also extend the, uh, into some other variations uh, in some other systems. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at uh, reaction diffusion uh, as well. So some of the things that I've made with cellular automata, these are just some of my, my sketches. Um, and this is sort of like the output. So I've, I've taken the um, kind of like what I've generated using these simple rules, but then also extended it further using Touch Designer to you know, generate geometry or um, kind of create feedback systems or these bottom three are using the motion of those systems um, with optical flow to push particle systems around. So you start using them as inputs for other modules that you work with. Uh, so we'll talk about that at the end. Um, and then this is uh, a few other examples, but this is reaction diffusion, which is the simulation of um, kind of two or more chemicals kind of um, like diffusing together. So uh, moving from one to the other. And so these are a few other um, kind of, of my explorations using uh, reaction diffusion. Uh, a couple more here. So there's a lot of variety that I find you can get is if you start using these as inputs for other systems or even just exploring um, and like adding other elements to kind of like modify uh, these systems. But really, they're, they're relatively simple to set up. Uh, so we're going to look at that it, uh, now. <laughs> so here we go. I'm going to close this. Um, the uh, files, did they make it around to you? They did. OK. You guys all got them? OK, sweet. All right, so um, I'm going to start by, th there's, there are examples for this, but I'm going to start by building it from scratch. So some of the stuff we're going to build today, uh, I'm going to step through the process. And then there are other things well, where we'll look at uh, complete examples. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about uh, reaction diffusion. So let me see. Uh, here we go. So I did include a PDF in here. This is actually just like a straight PDF from a website uh, because you know it's nice to sometimes have those in case the website changes or um, in the future. But uh, this is from Carl Sims, who um, this tutorial I found really useful when like thinking about what reaction diffusion is. Um, so we have uh, two chemicals, A and B, in this case, and Chemical A is added at a given feed rate. And then we have a reaction where um, kind of like B replaces it. And so you have this um, kind of like element where this the system where uh, we, we still have this, like we have a grid of cells and chemicals are sort of flowing between one another based on um, kind of a set of rules. And the, the rules are pretty like, this is a pretty complex looking uh, formula at first. And so, um, We'll look at later how to actually take this. Um, there's like an example in GLSL that I've put together that uses this. We're not going to look at it fully, but there is actually a really simple way to um, do some reaction diffusion that doesn't fully and like accurately um, kind of represent this formula, but is a nice way to quickly simulate it um, using like simple tops. So we'll start with that first. Hey. Okay. Uh, I think we're all good. Okay, so um, this is like a formula I've looked at a bit now, and I, I understand it a bit more now. But really, what it is is uh, you have basically two um, chemicals. They both have 
rates. And then there, there's this thing called a Laplacian function, which essentially um, you can also think of this as convolution. And there is a convolve top in Touch Designer that lets us uh, do this convolution. And so um, the really simple way to do this system, which doesn't necessarily uh, represent some of these like complicated feed and kill rates that really like add a little bit more um, like dynamic qualities to the system. It, it really gives us kind of a linear uh, transition between the two chemicals. So you don't get quite uh, as dynamic uh, kind of patterns out of it, but it does let you, as I said, use uh, tops. So let's go do that now and in touch, and then we'll get back to this kind of system a little bit later after we've done uh, some cellular automata. So we'll, we'll loop back to this again. But um, this is like the, the general principle of, of uh, reaction diffusion. Um, so this, this, that's this uh, basic example toe is the example, but I'll, I'll look at kind of how to set that up first. Um, and I, I think of this as the, like when I think about it, I, I consider it the blur sharpen technique because really you have a feedback loop and then you take, um, you blur it using a blur top and then you sharpen it using uh, Convolve. And just by placing those two things in a feedback loop, you get some really interesting patterns that basically um, look like this kind of reaction diffusion system. So uh, we're going to start by, let's see. Um, we want some kind of seed for this system, something that when we that we start with, so it's like an initial state. Um, so this can really be anything you want. And this is one place where you can really explore uh, kind of like starting in different places and seeing where it grows. Um, I'm just going to start by creating a noise top. And we can make it a little bit larger. So in the resolution tab, I'm going to change this to 1080 by 1080. Um, and I'll add a feedback top right after this. So uh, now I'll be able to pulse this feedback if I want to kind of re, uh, um, like restart the system. Um, Next, uh, we want a blur. So I'll just add that right after the feedback. And we could um, build this whole network from scratch for the sharpen, but there's actually a really useful tool in the palette that we can actually grab called sharpen. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then we'll open it up and look at what's happening inside of it. So if we open up the palette um, under image filters and then scroll down, we have sharpen down here. If we drag this out, and just kind of plug in our blur. And then um, I'll also increase the sharpen amount to 1 and place this into a null. And then uh, now I just need to drag my null and drop it on top of the feedback target top. So I'm just going to drop it right on top. Um, and actually, we're already getting kind of immediately that sort of reaction diffusion pattern um, just by creating that feedback loop initially. Um, so is everyone kind of following along so far? Anyone having any issues? Cool. Sweet. So um, like I said, this doesn't really emulate the exact, uh, this formula. This uh, is the Gray-Scott formula. Um, but because it, it, because it gives us like a symmetrical diffusion between the two. So typically, you're going to see the, like the black and the white sections being um, looking really similar. Um, but it is a, a really useful way to start playing with these patterns and staying kind of all inside of tops. Um, and you'll see that if we start changing things like the filter size, for instance, um, of our blur, we can get, to a degree, uh, some larger patterns. So that, to, uh, in tandem with the sharp, like the degree of the sharpen, um, kind of affects the quality of, uh, like the size of the patterns you're creating. Um, now, if we jump inside this sharpen uh, base, if we want to look at what's going on here, um, we'll see here this this one that's mostly black. If you can kind of see what's going on, uh, this is the convolve top that's actually doing. Um, in this case, it's, it's kind of doing like a sh it's doing a sharpen technique. But it's very similar to um, it's the same principle as this Laplacian that's being talked about in the um, the write up. So what this does is, for each pixel, it um, 
looks at the neighboring pixels around it. So we have like the center pixel that we're looking at. And then uh, we look at all eight neighbors, so diagonal and adjacent neighbors, and apply weights to them. So uh, in this case, we have the center is weighted as eight, and all of the neighbors are weighted as negative one. So we multiply the values of each pixel and its uh, each neighboring pixel by these weights and add them all together. Um, and what you'll notice is actually this, if you add up all of these weights, uh, you get zero, right? So, um, and that actually is, is kind of directly related to the stability of this system. And if we wanted to start exploring uh, some other kind of like options here, um, one thing you can just even start playing with is changing these weights. And you'll see like pretty quickly if we just type in some other numbers, suddenly like everything is gone, right? So it is actually pretty picky about um, like we have to be careful not to make it unstable by uh, too much or then we'll just completely um, like by making this negative two, it just went to black completely because we've sort of weighted very much in the negative direction. Um, and that's kind of black being zero. Uh, so um, if you do that, you can always go and pulse the feedback to sort of get back to where you were. Um, so we have the system happening again. And um, I don't have a lot of these like <laughs> off the top of my head, but there's some things you can kind of tweak if we say wanted to make um, like the diagonals a little bit more like stronger and pull things out diagonally then we might make these, instead of being negative 1, negative 0.5. And because we're now the neighbors add up to negative 6, we can change the center to 6 so that the whole um, matrix, when you add it up, it's 0. And that should give us a stabler outcome. So I, we can actually see what this does. Um, so right now, this convolve is looking at this null dat. So just swapping these. Um, sort of subtle changes, but you can, this is definitely a place where you can start to play to get kind of like stringier looking reaction diffusion looks. Um, and so definitely like when I first started working with reaction diffusion, this was a lot of what I was working with was changing these uh, values. Um, a couple other things you can do to start adding, say, or here I can make it so you can see what's going on a little better here. Um, one second, there we go. Just going to set this up as a top viewer quick. All right. Um, is to start adding transformations or displacement into the feedback loop. So this is something that's really like interesting to play with almost within any feedback loop. So if you've done any work with feedback, you've probably already familiar with some of these ideas. But um, something like a transform, if we wanted to, say, have things pull um, like scale outwards a little bit, we could set this to 0 0.001. And then we get sort of a stretching effect um, where everything is kind of growing. And we could do the same by setting this to, say, 0 0.999 to get something that's uh, pulling in. Um, and of course, this will eventually just like scrunch into the center <laughs> if we, oh, I actually rotated it there. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, you can get some like interesting patterns just by manipulating uh, with a transform within the feedback loop. Um, another thing that I am definitely a fan of is the displace top in conjunction with uh, noise. So the displace top has two inputs. This first one is your source image, and then the second one um, uses multiple channels from this no uh, the input. So it could be the red and the, um, in this case, it defaults to red and blue, but it could be, say, the red and the green channels uh, to kind of push or displace the pixels uh, that are coming in. So if we take our noise, which is, uh, we should probably make it the same resolution. So I'm going to increase this to 1080 by 1080, um, set it to uh, be RGB. So toggle off that monochrome. Um, and let's see, another thing we want to do, I usually set these to, if we go to the common tab, uh, this pixel format is a way that you can get slightly like higher quality noise. Uh, so if we leave it at the 8-bit texture, we're limiting our 
displacement to 256 values. So by dropping this to, say, like 16 bits, we can get um, a little bit more interest, like higher quality uh, displacement. Um, and then if I drag this in, OK, suddenly it just like disappeared. And that's because we still need to drop this displace weight, which is 1. Um, so it just like completely moved everything off the screen. But if we drop this down to, say, 0.01, might even be too large at 0.01. Uh, I'll disable the transform for a second so we can get this happening. Um, let's see. Okay, so still a little bit too intense. Like we get, we really like see this noise. Uh, we don't really get the reaction diffusion pattern anymore. So um, we can actually bring this displace weight down even more until we can actually see that again. It might even be 0.001. Um, you know what, I'll leave it at 0 0.001, and then we can uh, reduce it in the noise itself with the uh, amplitude. So um, let's see what else here. OK, so we're still getting really dramatic stuff, uh, but we could increase the period, for instance, to start um, so we don't have such tight spirals. And then we start to get kind of some interesting stuff happening. Um, so you can really play with like how much noise you're inputting into the system. Um, and yeah, it's like I find this stuff to be pretty organic and it's pretty simple to start playing with it and getting a lot of um, kind of like different quality textures from it. Um, so, you know, again, you can move back to say the blur uh, and the sharpen to get. So by decreasing the blur, um, now I'm getting like much smaller growths. Uh, and that's something that you can, you know, change like halfway through a process or something to start to get effects where it, Maybe your system blooms into smaller detail and then condenses. Um, so really, just like even with some simple uh, operators, we can get a lot of like diverse uh, looks just from, yeah. And it's again, it's not like uh, it's like really not the full reaction diffusion formula. So we'll look at a little bit later kind of my attempts to make that in uh, GLSL. But um, for now, we can spend a little bit of time if you guys want to, uh, you all want to play with it a little bit. But we can also, uh, if you have any questions, I can answer those now too. Oh, yeah, sure. So just uh, noise is like the input to this feedback. And then um, the two key operators are really that are in this feedback loop are the blur. And, and then the sharpen um, is from the palette, though inside of it, Essentially, we have a convolve top, and so we looked at, you know, switching between some different um, uh, convolution tables here, and but then the rest of this is just kind of a nice tool that's in the palette that lets us control, uh, like how much this sharpen effect. You see, if I decrease this, we suddenly just get kind of like only blurry blurriness. Um, so it's really the blur and the sharpen that work together to create this effect. The transform is disabled, but if I enable it, um, it's sort of pulling it. Right now, it's scaling it down slightly. So it pulls it towards the center. Like if I was going to make this 0.999, the, uh, the displace, this displace to uh, top has a. Um, Right now, actually, we haven't even we have this noise input into a displace top. Yeah, if the weight's too high, you'll probably lose your pattern completely. Um, and and you can do things too, like um, like right now this noise isn't moving, so we could go to transform and say type in um, abs time dot seconds, and it's moving way too fast. So let's multiply that by like point one. And so now you could have um, sort of like the displacement shifting slightly um, so that you're not always kind of like displacing it with the same noise as well. So that's just with the um, really like super common Python expression that I use all the time when I want to just make something move based on on time. Cool. Other other questions? Sweet. So yeah, if you want, you can save where you are with this. And there's also the... Um, example, the basic example is pretty much the same network. 
Um, we'll come back to Reaction Diffusion a little bit later, but I want to now transition to talking about cellular automata. Um, so let's just close this. I don't need this anymore. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm like a big fan of these networks, and I feel like I don't see them used uh, very often. These these patterns, but essentially, um, there's a, there's a few different types of cellular automata, and I want to start with elementary cellular automata, which is uh, kind of like something that's been researched and written about quite extensively by Stephen Wolfram. So this is actually from his uh, from like Wolfram Math World, which talks about this type of cellular automaton, um, this elementary system. So this is a one-dimensional cellular automata. So uh, what this does is um, we have, in cellular automata, we have these a grid, basically, that's a simulation. So the main idea is that each um, frame, which we can think about like in, in the context of touch designer already, we have frames, right? So things update each frame. Um, so each frame. Every single cell, and, and these cells, these are pi essentially pixels and cells we can think about as the same thing because we're already dealing with uh, video textures, which are a grid of um, basically just a grid. So we're thinking about grids, right? Each of these cells, uh, in this case, they only have two states. So they're either alive or they're dead. Um, or in this case, like black and white, off and on, we can kind of think about as like a binary. and um, the way that this one-dimensional cellular automata works is we start with a seed at the very top row. And then each adjacent row is calculated based on the neighbors right above it. So up top are all the different possible um, kind of like configurations that we can have for uh, the upper neighbor, the northwest neighbor, and the northeast neighbor. Um, so they could be all on or all off, or sort of any combination of those. And there are eight possible combinations. Um, so what uh, Stephen Wolfram realized is that you could basically come up with um, a rule to define this, which is a kind of an 8-bit binary number of zeros and ones. So this says, OK, if all three of my upper neighbors are alive, then the lower cell is going to be dead. And then if the first two are alive and the last one's dead, dead and so so forth so it's sort of this like really simple rule set that determines what a uh, lower neighbor's value is going to be and so then after it calculates the next line it just moves down and what you get are these really um kind of like varying and interesting patterns some of them are like kind of complex and non-repeating based on uh the different permutations of this rule so um because this is an eight, there's only eight possible uh, upper configurations, then we have two to the eight possible rules. And that's wh uh, why this rule set, we um, all of these, you know, rule 30, for instance, is actually 00011110 as represented up top because the binary representation of 30 is this binary string. Um, so that's sort of the like the lexicon for describing, like this is how we describe these rules. Uh, at least this is how Stephen Wolfram does it. Um, and I think it's a really elegant way to do it. Um, so you can see here how, say, rule 62 breaks down into like a binary sequence. Um, so yeah, this is just bit, um, a little bit about this system. But we'll look at now how we can do this in Touch Designer. And we're going to be using uh, GLSL, which I know some of you might have never touched. So I'm going to try to. Um, one, like talk you through what exactly why and what I'm doing. Um, the reason I think uh, GLSL works really well for this system is that um, what it does differently than say a sequence of code in like a Python script or a C++ is each pixel is going to be operating independently of all the other ones in parallel. And if you think about this system, that's all we really need to do. Each pixel has a set uh, set of instructions that it needs to follow. Uh, that's all it really needs to do is look at its neighbors and say, should I be alive or dead in the next frame? So I think it's also a really nice way to sort of look at like how like a simple way to think about also GLSL um, because it, yeah, I think it's really clear cut as far as like why you would use GLSL to do this. So um, 
Okay, so I'll I'll reference this again, but let's um open up a fresh touch designer document and start kind of diving into this. Um any any questions so far about this kind of type of cellular like what cellular automata is? Does that make sense so far? Yeah, so we'll talk about we'll we'll make a Conway's game of life from this system, uh expanding upon it soon. So yeah. Uh cool. Okay. So I'll just delete the basic uh, that and close the palette to have some more space. All right, so the first thing I want to do here is again, I want like a seed, like in the same way that we seeded the last network with uh, noise, I want sort of an initial starting condition. Uh, and in this case, a lot of these are starting with like one pixel or just like kind of one point at the top and they trickle down mostly into these pyramid shapes. Um, so I'm gonna start by making a rectangle top. And we can keep this maybe, um, I don't know, it's a good size, like probably, we can keep it at 256 for now. And I'm gonna make this rectangle a bit smaller. So I'll click this drop down and change this to pixels. So instead of a uh, fraction and set it to five by five. So I'll, I'll really just start with like a five by five um, rectangle and then move the uh, Y center to 0.5. So it's positioned like right at the top where we would want to say seed our, um, our system. Uh, next, I'm going to create a feedback top. So like one interesting thing you'll see is that pretty much all of these systems rely on feedback. And it's because we're updating, like we want the previous frame to feed into the system. And that's essentially what a feedback top does is it it looks at the last frame um, from whatever's pointing at it and that's how you avoid these uh, dependency loops so um, so we're going to create this feedback top and then um, we can put this into a glsl top so this is where we're going to write our rules for the uh, cellular automata system the elementary system and then out of this a null and I'm going to drag that onto my feedback top. Um, so right now it's just going to be white because that's what this uh, this shader is outputting is just white. Um, one uh, one other thing that I'll do now that will make more sense later, but uh, is I'm going to add an add top between the feedback and the GLSL, and I'm just going to bring my rectangle in, um, and this is because I want that top sort of seed to always be present because it's going to, if it disappears, then we're suddenly going to not have anything. Everything's going to be dead on the top line. So I just want to make sure that that seed is always present at the top. Um, okay. So let's open up uh, this shader in an editor. It's going to open up in Sublime. Um, if you don't, if it doesn't automatically, it should, if you've installed um, your highlighting show up as GLSL, um, and I'm going to set this to the right so that we can kind of see what's happening while I go. So um, a little bit about shaders, because I know <laughs> some people might be really fresh and not have uh, experience with these yet. Um, so we're dealing with, it's, it looks a lot like C++, and the syntax is pretty important. So just we need to always end our lines with semicolons, for instance, um, and there's a lot of like always finishing curly brackets and, and parentheses. A lot of those things, if you miss any of that, it's really specific, so you'll get um, compile errors. So uh, that's something to just be really careful with. Same goes for like capitalization, case sensitive sensitivity is really a key too. Um, and we're dealing with a few different uh, data types. So you'll see things saying VEC4, VEC3, VEC2, and float, and those are um, basically float is just a floating point value at that pixel. Um, but a, a vec4 is a four-dimensional floating point. And uh, really, like all, any of these video textures we're looking at, we can think about as vec4s that we're working with in our top networks. So these are all, um, they have red, green, blue, and alpha often. Not always, but that's typically what you have in uh, if you're dealing with, say, like an 8-bit fixed or 16-bit float. Um, so our, uh, our VEC4s 
have those four different components. And those can be written as, um, like we can access those in different ways. Uh, so you might say, if we've declared vec4 color, and we set it to another a vector of vec4, um, right now, every, red, green, blue, and alpha are all one, which is why we see this as white. But if we say changed uh, added commas here, instead of setting all four of these elements to one, we could set them to, um, I could set red to one, uh, green, yeah, green to zero, blue to one, and alpha to say 0.5. Let me see if I made a mistake here. Um, and hit save. And now we get sort of magenta uh, with a little bit of alpha. So you can see how we're basically saying, OK, I want this this shader says for every single pixel, it, it like looks at this and says, OK, I'm going to be, this is what color I am. And then it outputs it. Um, and so we're making the entire thing the same color. Um, so a really key thing with shaders is that we have uh, one piece of information that we do have at each um, pixel is its pixel coordinates or UV coordinates. Um, so this is essentially a coordinate system that's normalized. Uh, does anyone know what normalized means in this context? It's like going from 0 to 1. So instead of saying, OK, I have 256 pixels, you might have a coordinate system where you said, OK, 0, 0, 256, 256 in the top right. Um, but if we want to be able to say change resolution and we suddenly go from 256 to 500 by 500, um, suddenly our coordinate system needs to be adjusted. So normalizing this coordinate system, so we have 0, 0, top right is 1, 1, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0. Um, I might have said that backwards there. But uh, <laughs> that, that essentially lets us uh, change resolutions and all of our um, code automatically just changes uh, accordingly. So that's that's um, we can this vuv dot st. This is giving us uh, a pixel coordinate, like the pixel coordinate at that location. And actually, if we wanted to see that um, in action, we could say, okay, our vec four. Instead of using these colors, uh, just like uh, constants, I could say, okay, actually, I'm going to type v uv dot s. Um, and so this is grabbing the first, uh, comp this is just like the first value. So this is the kind of like x coordinate and then vuv dot t. And then everything else will leave the same. Uh, well, no, 0 and 0 for the second one, 1. And you'll see now we have this kind of gradient where the very bottom, um, we're, we're only changing the red and the green pixels for the output. So the very bottom left is uh, black because it's zero. that's our 0, 0 coordinate. The very top right corner is 1, 1. So that's both red and green at their maximum values, which gives us yellow. And then um, we have basically like 1, 0 where we have red at its max and 0, 1, where green is at its max. So this is just like a good thing to be able to say, OK, this is like we can see what those values are. And that's uh, an important piece of information that we're going to use to say, OK, not only do I know um, like what, like where that pixel is located, but I can then find my neighbors around me. So we'll look at that in just a moment. But uh, another important piece here is the um, ability to sample an incoming texture. So uh, these inputs are just different sources. And we can access them through this function called uh, texture. And then this is something that you can find uh, more information about. We'll look there in a second on the write a GLSL top uh, on the wiki. So it's a really useful resource. It has a lot of this information where you might not know, like, what is std 2 d inputs bracket 0? It's like if you you know, don't read that document. You might not know what that is or how to write that. So, um, but this is essentially saying I want to look at the first input or the zeroth input, and then um, I'm going to sample the pixel at this texture coordinate. So, um, if we change the vec4 color to this, if we just comment out our uh, this other one where I'm showing the coordinates. Um, 
okay, well, it's funny. It's just now this little white square popped up, and that's because we have this feedback loop going. So it still has the color from previously. But if we pulse our feedback loop, all right, there we go. So now we've got exactly the same as our rectangle. Um, I'm actually going to bring the kind of out of order, but just bring the background alpha up on this so that we've got uh, black happening. OK, there we go. So um, yeah, does that uh, make sense so far? I know like if you haven't done this before, it takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around it. But um, what we're going to do now is say, now that we know how to grab uh, sort of the, this is like a way that we can say, OK, what is the um, previous state of a cell? So if you think about it in this feedback loop, um, when we're sampling this input, every time we sample it, we're looking at sort of where it was previously, right? That's what this feedback is giving us. And then um, outputs whatever we do to it. So right now, we're just outputting the same value. That's why it's the same every time. But um, if we change it at all, then this feedback will update on the next frame. And so we can continuously monitor with uh, this function here what the value of the previous state is, and then use that to calculate what the next state is. Um, but we do need a little bit more than that, right? So if we look at our cellular automata, uh, elementary cellular automata, we also need to know not just what the previous, we actually don't even really care what the previous value is. We really just want to know what the upper neighbors are. We want to know what those pixels are. Um, and so. What we can do is I'm actually going to make uh, a function here to do this, because we're going to do this over and over again. And especially once we get to the um, 2D version, we're going to be looking at more neighbors. So it's a basically a function that where I can say I want to look at uh, a neighbor that's like a va an x value above and a y value like left or right. So, um, so let's create that here. And if you if you are lost, just like let me know, and I can clarify things too as we go. Um, so I know I want this um, function to return a value. So it's the the type of value I want back is a float. Uh, it could be an integer too, right? We're actually only dealing with zero and one, but I know this is just like thinking a little bit ahead. I know that later we're gonna want this to be a float, so we won't have to change it in the future, and it'll work both ways. Um, so I'll make this a, I'll write float, and then I'll call this get, just because I'm like getting a, a value. You could call it something else more informative, like get neighbor, but it's a little bit wordy to write neighbor over and over. So I'm just going to write float get. And um, in these parentheses, I can give it uh, define arguments. So this is like information I pass into this function every time I call it. Um, and I really want an x position and a y, a y value. It's so if I say I want, uh, the pixel right above, then I could say, OK, um, 0 for x and 1 for y, and that would go up 1. right? So I want to be able to just like look at adjacent neighbors by feeding two values, an x and a y, into this function. Um, so I'll type int, because these are integers, and uh, x comma int y, and then curly bracket, which will automatically close. So if you don't have a text editor, make sure you close all your curly brackets. Um, OK, and then inside of this, um, I essentially I want to determine a new coordinate that I'm going to sample. So I want to sample the pixel that's one above. So I'm going to create a, another float and call this UV. Um, this is just like a new, a new coordinate, essentially, that I'm going to calculate. And I'll set this equal to. Uh, I want to start where I'm currently located. And so where I'm currently located is this right here, vuv.st. That's where the pixel that's cal currently calculating, because remember, all of our pixels are, are just doing this at the same time. Um, the location of this pixel, so vuv.st. You know what? This needs to be a vec2. I <laughs> don't think this can be a float. So, um, so this actually needs to store an x and a y coordinate. So it can't, it can't just be a float. Um, and so from that coordinate, I'm also going to add. And this is where um, I can use those x and those y values. So I'm going to create a new two-dimensional uh, vector, a vec2. And here I'm going to type x and y. So this is basically like the unit that I want to, like if this is going to, if I'm going to feed in 1, 1, 
I'll look at the top, like the uh, diagonal pixel um, to it. Uh, but if I feed in one one, I'm actually not going to get one pixel. I'm going to be because um, if you rem remember, our coordinate system is normalized from zero to one. So it's not like I'm going to be dealing with, uh, you know, it's not like if my 256 by 256 texture, I need to be moving basically one divided by 256, right? So I divide the width and the height, uh, one by the width and one by the height, and that tells me the fraction that I move um, in the coordinate system to find the neighbor. Um, and there's actually a nice way to do this. Like when I first started doing this, I would like feed in, I would have a, like a uniform or I'd feed in, feed in a variable that was my width and my, and my height, but there's a totally way to get this um, inside Touch Designer. So I'll actually show you this page now because it's really useful. Um, if we click the question mark on GLSL and we go to the help page, okay. And then here there's a link that says write a GLSL top. And this is where there's a lot of really good information about all of these like um, things like say, how do we know what the resolution of our uh, texture is? So um, I'm just going to quickly search this. This is a uh, UTD. Here we go. So if you read through all of this, you'll eventually find these built-in uniforms. And this is where we can find um, the resolution. So for example, here's the example. If we want to get the width of the first input, right? Because we can have multiple inputs too. So if we want to know the width of the first input, we can type uh, utd 2d infos, uh, then bracket zero dot res dot z. So you can see in this res, it contains four different things. Um, one thing I, I didn't, I kind of glossed over that hopefully hasn't been so super confusing so far is that um, in order to access these these different components say like in a vec4 there are four different components and it might be red green blue alpha values but it could also be x y z w positions or in texture coordinates uh, they use the word letters s t p q um, all of these can be used interchangeably so if i want the third value of a vec4 i could type z but i could also type um, b or STP, Q, P, right? I don't really use the P in the Q ever. So, <laughs> um, but uh, so yeah, you get um, different ways that you can access them. And that's really because in GLSL space, um, sometimes you're dealing with pixels that are representing colors, but sometimes the pixels are representing values like a position, and sometimes they're representing a coordinate uh, position. So, uh, you know, it just gives you more flexibility to choose the sort of like, uh, like dot z if you're dealing with like something that the data is similar to um, you know that that letter um, as far as its meaning. So okay, a little bit of a digression, but I think hopefully that does that make sense. Have you guys encountered that before a little bit? Maybe okay, um, cool. So we actually one handy thing is that they actually already give us if we look at the first two elements in this um, uh, res we have one over the width and one over the height. So actually, we don't really need to calculate that ourselves because those are two, two things we can access with um, you know, x and y if we type xy, dot xy, right? Instead of dot z, we'll type res dot xy, and that'll give us um, one over the width and one over the height. So let's go back over here. You can copy this if you want. You know, Just copy this section. Um, and what we want to do is multiply this by our vec2 that has the kind of like the offset is really the word I should have used, um, the pixel offset, so uh, to find the neighbors. So we'll multiply this by utd 2 d infos 0 dot res dot xy, and then semicolon to end that line. So what this really just, all of this does is it just gives us the location of our kind of neighboring pixels based on uh, these x and y values we give it. Um, so the next thing we want to do is what this get really should do is, is it should give us the value of that pixel too. So we can also sample our input here as well because uh, we want just basically like to know 
okay, what is that neighbor's value? That's what we're going to use to determine, um, you know, this whole rule set here. So um, to do that, we can actually use this texture uh, std 2D inputs. Uh, so I'm going to copy that up here. And we can just return this right away. So return is the keyword that will let us um, output the value. So when we run this function, once we get to return, it'll just spit out whatever we type after it. Um, and that's how we can you know, reuse functions. So, um, so I'll paste that texture. And so that's looking at um, that first input. But then instead of looking at the current coordinate, right? so that's what v, uv.st looks at, let's just type uv, which again was my new coordinate. And uh, we also want to make sure we're getting this will actually return uh, like a vec4 because because our input has red, green, blue, and alpha. But we really just want um, one of those values because we're really dealing with like um, we want to return a float, which is like either one or zero. So we don't really care about like the green or the blue. We're just going to make this all monochrome, basically black and white. So uh, I'll just type R for red. So that's that first like the red value of that pixel. Um, OK, so there we go. We've got ourselves. Hopefully, I didn't make mistakes. So we'll see when we compile it, but uh, <laughs> when we save it. But uh, here's our, our get function. Now, the next step is we want to get this lined up a little bit. Um, look at these three neighboring pixels. So we can reuse this function in a second. So we're going to. Um, I'm going to create three floats. So there's float. Uh, we want the north west pixel. So I'll call this float NW, just so I kind of know what neighbor this is. Um, and I can set this to, I'll set this equal to get. And then in this case, um, the x is negative 1, and the y is 1. So I'll type negative 1, comma 1, saying I want to move one pixel to the left, one pixel up. And that should give me my northwest neighbor. Um, and that's all I'm going to do for this so far. So just store it in that variable. Um, and I'll paste this two more times just to speed up this process a little bit. So this next one is our north. I'm going to say north north just to say that I'm going like, you know, that way they kind of stay similar in format. So the north north uh, direction and northeast. And then I also need to change those. Uh, offsets as well. So in this case, we don't want to move in the x direction, right? So we're just looking directly above. And in this case, uh, next one, northeast, we want to go one to the right and one up. So um, so this should theoretically, northwest should be telling me what uh, you know that northwest neighbor is for that given pixel. Um, now that we have these values, um, I'm going to give myself a new float, which I'm just going to use to store. Uh, this is like a temp, like a fl value that's just going to keep tr like store the um, the updated pixel value. So this is like, what what is this cell going to be now that we know its neighbors? Um, so I'll just call this R, but you could, you could call it something different. Um, and we can set this to 0 if we want just so that it has a value, though we are going to make sure it has a value uh, based on its neighbors in a second. Um, so now, now that we know this, we can actually write a little bit of logic to determine um, kind of what the new value is. Because we have kind of right here tells us, like, oh, yeah, if all, th like, depending on what rule we're doing, um, we know, like, oh, yeah, if all of these are, all of the neighbors are on, the new value is off. Uh, or, like, if, um, one like the first one is on, but the next two are off. Then the new value is on. So we really it's like a very clear cut um, like logic system, and so we can use a series of um, if else statements here. That's like there's probably a, a better way to do it, but uh, it's like the the easiest way to sort of conceptualize it is we say okay if, and then we're gonna say uh, our northwest pixel is equal to one, and then. We want to use uh, two ands. So and our north north pixel is equal to one. And oops, let's get that. And 
our northeast pixel is equal to one. So that's that first case. And then um, right now, I'm just going to hard code rule 30. And we'll look at in a second how we can actually feed in, uh, like a way to feed in a number uh, and then break it into like binary pieces and and just like not have to type in all of these values every time. But um, but for now, let's just type zero, like r equals zero. So we know um, that we want to, yeah, we know that that pixel wants to be zero. So we can type else, and you have a question? Yeah, it does. I just didn't really look at what I was typing. Uh, <laughs> so there we go. Good catch. Um, cool. So yeah, make sure that those are all cap capitalized. And then, um, yeah, the rest of these are going to be else ifs because really we know like if all of them are on, none of these other none of these other possibilities could exist, right? So um, this will just be a series of else if statements. And um, what I'll do is I'll just copy. Let's see, maybe this amount so that I can just kind of paste it along. Uh, I think that no, that won't work. Um, here, I'll copy this again. So we'll copy the else ifs once we've written the else ifs. So OK, we're going to copy all of these, and then we can change um, all the corresponding values in a second. So let's just go ahead and do that. Let's see if I can. I might have to do some tabbing in a second. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Close that last bracket. I'm going to just tab in so that it looks a little bit better, which is? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, oh, you, I just hit tab. I selected them and hit tab. I don't. Yeah, there's there's probably a quick format. I don't know, have it installed or know what the shortcut is. <laughs> um, okay, so a couple things we need to change. First are these the rules. We can do that first. So zero zero zero, and then for uh, we have one 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 one. This is a shortcut for Sublime. That's kind of nice. Is to do the control click. And then you have like multiple cursors, so I could hit delete one and just type in multiple places at once, which can be handy. Um, so zero 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 one 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 zero, um, and then we need to also change all of these sort of like equals. So the first one is one 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 zero. So you can just kind of go through and make sure that it lines up with this same order. Uh, so now we have one zero one for the third one zero zero. Zero one one. It's all the different combinations. Oh, come on. And then the bottom is zero zero zero. Okay, so, whew, so we're pretty much there. Um, I think the the last step. Now we actually know we've set our new pixel based on its neighbors. Uh, but we still need to output that value. And we'll see if I made errors when we when we save this in a second. But uh, <laughs> so one way we can do this is um, just for vec4 color, and then we're going to create a new vec4. And in this, we'll type uh, vec3 parenthesis r. So this is saying that I want r to be the value for the first three um, of those values. So red, green, and blue. I'm just setting those all to the same value. So we're just going to have white for when it's on, black for when it's off. And then comma 1, because I want my alpha to always be 1. So I don't want to set my alpha to 0, 2 and get transparency. Um, so let's see if this works. I hit save. Go back here. Oh, look at that. OK, great. So <laughs> it worked. Um, and if you have some errors, you'll see those show up in this GLSL info. So this is how we can debug. If you did say you forgot a print like a semicolon on line 25, you'll see how it tells you, okay, really 26 it's it's pointing at. But um you can see it says, oh yeah, I was it was expecting a semicolon. So you if you do get that, uh you'll want to just take a look at like the see if you can find the line number in this um compile result. Uh did anyone get errors where they're had issues, or did everyone? Everyone's compiled and gave you this nice little um, automata pattern. Everyone good? Okay. Well, let me know if you have issues or questions, or maybe you're behind. That's okay. But um, 
so yeah, it's cool. We've got we've got ourselves. This is like if we look back here, it's actually it looks. I mean, I know this is just the the beginning, but you can see how it's also inverted, which is a little hard to see. But you can see how we've got uh, the our cellular automata pattern, and um, really, really the last piece that we want here is to be able to just type in our rule, right? So if we wanted to type in, like right now we we just typed in those ones and zeros, but we want to be able to say, uh, okay, if I if I type in 126, I want it to just draw rule 126. Um, so there's a, it took it probably took me a long time to figure this out. It's like a, a little bit, like a bit of a, a bit trick because we're dealing with like binary. So you have to do a little bit of like bitwise operations, which I won't go into super detail, but I will show you what it is. Um, so before I do that, I do want to make these all nearest neighbor because I just the interpolation it gets a little bit fuzzy. So uh, I'll do that quick first. Let's see, common. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's doing something weird where it's flickering. I don't know why it's flickering. Okay. Okay, there we go. This is a little crisper, so you can see the pattern. Um, okay, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, so if I, like I said, if I, if I miss this semicolon and it's like around line 25 and I save it, you'll see this number here. It says like zero parenthesis 26, really because there's like an extra I don't know. I it just it's close, but it's not exactly line 26, but it's just around there. Um it's telling me it expected a comma or a semicolon right at this bracket. So it's giving it you sometimes it gives you less information, but oftentimes it'll tell you the line that you want to look at, which is helpful for debugging because you can say, "Okay, what like what what's going on on line 25?" and you can like zoom in and say, "Okay, did I miss like a semicolon, uh, is there a bracket too many or too few? Um, and then I think about something like Sublime or, or other editors is it lets you click and see where um, the brackets line up. So yeah, does anyone else have errors? I can probably pop around and help. OK, yeah. I don't know if this, oh, this clip's on. Um, cool. So let's just see. And I'll see if we if it's a quick one. What's it, what's this guy say? Okay, undefined variable color. Go back to the so we can see both at the same time. Forty-two. Oh, um, we just need this last line. Vec, you see how I changed that vec four color to? It's like commented out right now. That line forty. That it's just I think it's just missing that. Cool. Who else had an, an issue? Yeah. Float seventeen. Yeah. Oh, um, so you'll wanna add semicolons after all of those. Yeah. Yep, and uh, all three lines. So like it's just sort of uh syntax where all of your lines it's kind of like a period all all of your lines and then just you save that equals equals on 22 uh equals equals Oh, um, you you're just missing the like, uh, it says and 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 then equals equals. So you need northwest north north. You see how I have like the uh, that's what's so okay cool. Uh, did anyone else have an issue? Yeah. Okay, wait. Scroll to the left. Let's see what the network looks like. You're adding it. What's the rectangle look like? Oh, okay. 
Yeah. And are you seeing the white rectangle in, in the ad? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, interesting. Same thing, or didn't draw? Yeah. Um, if you if you open up the example, there is like the there's an example in the folder called wolfram.talks. So that could be something you could check. Uh, if that doesn't work, then it's definitely something that I don't know the answer to. Yeah, <laughs> but or I could help later. But uh, yeah, if you try the wolfram talks and that works, oh, okay. Oh, it's just an older version. That's okay. Okay, so you could look at this example. the The big difference between the wolfram talks that is this example uh, file is that it um, I used integers instead of floats for a lot of it because I the float's going to be useful later on in the workshop so that's really the big difference between those but um, yeah um, maybe afterwards we can probably figure it out too I want to make sure I get going yeah <laughs> maybe there's a lot of them there's 256 uh, I think you need a few more. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you need eight total. There are eight possible ones. So that that'll that'll uh help. Yeah. Yeah. A few people are getting it. Uh, it's showing up as just black. I'm not sure, off the top of my head, why that would happen. Um, yeah. You also have black? Hmm. Uh, what happens if you just set frag color to color at the end? Yeah, just type in color. Yeah, and just save. Or with, a, with a semicolon. Sorry, semicolon after color. Oh, did I save it? No. It's still having an issue. Yeah, the swizzle might be important. Yeah, pulse the. F well, yeah, I mean, adding it in should automatically do it. But, um, hmm. Well, cool. So, if you open up the, uh, the talks that's included, does it still give you that issue? I think that, yeah, I'm not sure why the one that we just wrote, what is different between them. But, uh, we could maybe figure that out at the end. I definitely want to keep rolling. But, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh no the the wolfram dot talks. Yeah. It's also black. Uh yeah, I'm not sure. A lot of people are getting that issue, but some aren't. So I don't know the exact trouble troubleshooting. Um yeah, if you if you check the, the wolfram dot talks, hopefully that's working on on the system. See if that if that's also working then it's probably some very small thing that I did here that <laughs> I don't like doesn't work on all systems or something. Okay, so yeah, you might be able to like see if there are subtle differences between those two. I'm not I can also look later. Um uh, cool. Uh but I think conceptually are there are there questions other than like the the black screen that I don't know how to explain. <laughs> uh, this stuff happens sometimes, so it's just like sometimes hard to go between systems. But uh, okay, cool. So, what time is it? Three forty. Okay, yeah. So I'm gonna keep moving forward a little bit, and um, I don't know. I guess it'll be use hard if you aren't seeing anything to keep going. So maybe we should figure this out now. Um, it's the what? Yeah, I think I don't use the swizzle, but I I don't know if that would uh should necessarily we could you could try that. I took that semicolon out. Um so you can see if this works, this is like the big change that is in the two because the swizzle according to the docs uh helps with cross-platform function, but uh I sometimes don't use it just out of like bad habit. <laughs> um so if if that works, that could be a potential fix. Let's just look at this quick troubleshoot. Uh, 
All right. So this this system's a little bit different in that it it's a little bit more built out. So this has um the option to say use a noise, like a little slice of noise at the top to get more interesting inputs, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. Also has a invert uh level that's inverting the output so it looks more like the um kind of ones on Wolfram Alpha, but uh or yeah, Wolfram Wolf Wolfram Math. Um Let's see. So if we look at these, I'm just going to see what's the big difference. So one one thing that's different in these two is you'll see that I am using like integers. Um, we haven't gotten to writing the rule yet, so we'll do that in just a second. But otherwise, it's mostly the same. So uh, are you guys still getting, you're all still getting black screens? OK. Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to troubleshoot that. I don't really know what the, the issue is. Um, but this one's working, though. The other, the, yeah, that one's working. So you might be able to, like, for now, uh, copy that over, right? So, like, if you have the, um, if you are getting that black screen, you could work from the, um, the Wolfram example in the talks. And the biggest issue, difference, and I'll, I'll bring this up when we get there, is once we get to adding, um, a variation on the Conway's game of life, you'll want to change some things to floats. And then if it breaks, then we'll kind of know maybe that's where the issue is. Um, OK, cool. But is everyone good to go Go on and add the rule? Great. So OK, this one actually already has it. So let's actually go back to my work in progress here. Um, OK, so yeah, we, we want to be able to say type in. Uh, like it'd be really nice to be able to type in 30 or or 60 and get that exact rule, right? Um, but the, the the issue here is that like 60 is getting broken into a binary number where each each like value corresponds to one of these different um, conditional statements. And so I think I like yeah, it took me a little bit of time to like parse this out, but an, it's a kind of an elegant solution I think is to um, we want to add an input to this, so like a uniform float at the top. We can actually just uncomment uniform float, and then we'll call this rule. Uh, so what uniform floats do is they let us pass um, values in to the shader from touch designer. They're called uniform because we can't change their value in the shader. So they're just they're uniform. They're fixed once we get them inside of the shader. But it's a way for us to interact with the shader from touch designer. Um, so when we add a uniform float, we also need to go to our shader. And on the vector, any of these vector pages, but usually you start on vector one, uh, we need to type a cor like the corresponding name there too. So this is actually how we pass that value in. So I'll type in rule. And for now, let's just make it 30, because then if it looks the same, we'll know that we've succeeded. right? And then we can change the rule from there. Um, and so to do this, I'm going to create a new function. And, and the whole role of this function is the, um, if I pass it in a integer, it will return the binary number, like the binary number corresponding to, say, like if I give it a 5, I want like the fifth binary number in that representation. Um, so we'll call this, let's see, uh, we want to return a float. Because it's going to be either, um, you know, one or a zero. Could even be an integer, but we can call it a float. And I'll call this get rule. And I'm going to give it one argument, so I can just maybe call this int k. And really, just in one line, we can do this return. And then I'll do. Um, I want to take the rule. And what I'm going to do is use uh, what's called a binary and. So and I'll, I'll break this down just in a second in plain text so you can actually kind of visualize what's going on. But I'll um, use a binary and with the value 1, which in binary is seven zeros and a 1. So um, when you binary and those, it's basically like you look at the two on top of one another. And all anywhere there's you know two zeros or like a zero in like one of those two numbers, it's going to be zero. So like a logical kind of and, basically. And so 
Um, I'm also going to bit shift it to the left using that value k. So when I give it a 5, for instance, it's going to shift that 1 over 5 values. Um, and then kind of like apply this binary and to our rule. Uh, and then the last thing we need to do is shift it back because that's going to give us maybe like a one that's in the middle of a binary number, binary string. And so we want to shift it back to the far right um, by also k. So we want to move it back k. Uh, so just to like, so you can get an idea of what this is, what this is doing, because I think it helps to like visualize it. Don't actually write this text. I'm going to delete it in a second. But if, if 30 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, um, our value for 1 is a bunch of zeros and 1. So it's like seven zeros and a 1. Um, applying a binary and is going to just say, OK, these are both zeros, so that's 0. You know, Really, this is going to be, uh, if we binary and, this is going to be seven, eight zeros, because all of the combinations of these values are 0. Um, one bit shifted. 1 is going to look like this. So ze six zeros, one, yeah. So we're shifting that. We're basically shifting it over one to the left. So you can think about it it's as we shift it over and apply the and. In this case, the binary and is going to give us uh, return the same value because we do have a 1 on that um, seventh digit. So it's basically a way of just like reading through the binary uh, number, returning like a 1. And then we, we also need to make sure that we put that one back because this is this is really two in binary so we'll shift it back yeah yeah um you know i might need this to be an integer i feel like i i do need that to be an int uh so we'll see because it might give me an error i sometimes forget like and then i'll do it and it'll bug me and then I'll fix it. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, when you teach yourself code, I think we've all been in this kind of boat where there's plenty of holes that you have to fill as you go. So um, I don't I don't really exactly know because my my bit shifting kind of like this definitely took me some time to like think through because I'm not doing bit shifting all the time. It was just a way to way to solve this problem that I thought was kind of like neat. So um, but yeah, if we shift this back one, we're going to get one or zero based on that um, input. So yeah, we'll see if the float works. If it doesn't, we can change it to uh, an int. So, yeah. I bet you that my original is an int. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. OK. So gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, we could do that. We We could just make this an int, though, right? That would. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK. So we do need to cast that as an int. Yeah. OK. So yeah, let's do that. I'm, I'm trying to remember what my original like, code looked like. We were just looking at it. Because um, I, I probably did something similar. Let's see. I do have them here. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. So my original was using an int. Um, and I think I actually passed an integer in and cast it as another variable. So there's like lots of ways to do this. But uh, we can we can just do this, um, and that should work. So let's see. We still need to set um, kind of r to our rules as well. So right now, it's like not actually looking at that corresponding pixel. So um, what we can do is for each of these, right, get rule, and then pass in the corresponding like number of shifts we want. So actually, this first one, we want to shift 7 to the left. So we're going to type 7. And then all the way down the line, 7, 6, 5, 4, so forth. All right. Oh, OK. I accidentally did that. All right, so let's see if this worked. It might. Oh, yeah, so good. So it's still compiled correctly. Um, but now, if we change this to say 126, 
we should see something different draw, right? So now we can type in any of those other rules that you can find on that PDF and actually see them kind of unfold. Um, and so yeah, it's a uh, these are pretty fun. I don't actually like use these super often, but I think it's like can be really cool as like a design resource or just um, like patterns to work with. And also this setup right here will serve really useful because we're going to basically uh, we're going to modify this just a little bit in order to get our 2D cellular automata because it's essentially the same idea. Um, before I move on, any other questions about kind of like this setup so far? All right. Cool. So yeah, um, and again, like that tool that uh, it's not really a comp. I didn't build that Wolfram tool out very much, but the talks here um, has a couple other things where you can say it has a. Uh, here, let me just make this full screen we, uh, so we can see what's going on. Um, this actually has a couple different inputs, so we could use just that kind of rectangle at the top or sort of like some noise at the top. So you get sort of different um, points. And then if we pulse new seed, we can see that we get some different patterns that are emanating from it. So, um, and it also has a slider for all the rules. So we can just drag that um, to choose a rule. Um, so if you look inside, there's just basically some noise that's getting uh, kind of like cropped, sliced at the top. So I'm only providing a, a top row of noise. Um, but yeah, you can play with this more. Uh, let's delete that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about 2D cellular automata. So, in preparation for this, I made a little visualizer to talk about this. Um, so, right now we've been doing dealing with one-dimensional cellular automata, where we just have like just looking at the top and it's going rows down. But 2D cellular automata, we're looking at um, all of our adjacent neighbors, so it's it's like looking all of, all around it to make its uh, determinations. And one of the um, did that actually open? Here we go. So one of the I think most famous um, examples is Conway's Game of Life. So this is going a little bit fast. It's kind of like flickering at 60 FPS, but we like, can slow this down a little bit. So this this is um, after this has kind of reached a very like stable stasis. But if we seed this again, you can see, OK, now we've got um, some like kind of interesting behavior happening. And if we keep seeding it, uh, this has all sorts of really like interesting properties that people, like this one right here is a glider <laughs> that just moved off. So there are like patterns that will send off other patterns continuously and generate them that move, or um, various like repeating patterns. Um, so it's been studied quite a bit. And they're actually a lot more um, you know, within that set of life as like a 2D cellular automata. There are many more rules beyond Conway's game of life, but his is certainly, uh, John Conway's is one of the kind of more uh, interesting and, and famous ones. But um, the way that this is defined, there are with uh, this just sort of like life cellular automata, we're only dealing with these first two sets of numbers. I don't know if you can see this, oh, there we go. So two, three slash three, um, you can ignore the one because we're going to get into that sort of uh, generations as like addition later. But uh, this is determining two just like basic rules for whether the cell is alive or it's dead. The first is S, which is stands for survival. So if the cell is already alive, it will continue to survive if it has either two or three neighbors that are also alive. So these two, this two three is representing like neighbor, like numbers of neighbors that need to be alive for it to continue to exist on the next frame. Um, the birth or B for birth stands for how many neighbors need to be alive for a cell that is dead to become alive. So if it's dead, it's just going to stay dead until, in this case, it has three neighbors that are also alive, and then that cell will become alive on the next frame. Um, so you can really see it happening if we. We like. Uh, I'll change this back to 60 and pause it. Uh, so you can. This is a a visualizer that's basically um, highlighting in red cells that are alive, and then the number represents how many neighbors it has that are, are alive. So it can really say like, okay, this one, um, these three all have three neighbors that are alive. 
and you'll notice how it just doesn't do anything. Like it just stays. It's a very like static um, pattern. It doesn't move at all. Uh, some of these you'll see, okay, we have um, basically like this has two neighbors that are alive. So it's just going to like stay alive. But the two that um, only have one, they're going to die on the next frame. And then the ones that are adjacent to the two, they both have three neighbors that are alive. So we can predict that those neighbors uh, are going to become alive on the next frame. So if we click forward, you'll see, oh, yeah, so our ones died, our threes were born. And then it's interesting because that's a pattern that will just keep oscillating forever. Um, but if we see this again, uh, oops, I didn't mean to go in there. Uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, you get some really kind of like interesting, actually, that was kind of a boring one. But at the top, we can see some stuff happening. Um, and there are really quite a few, like we'll look at uh, how to extend this more. But um, one thing that I found when I was researching this that was really helpful is this super old school website from 2001 that uh, has just like lists of all sorts of rule sets and like information about that. So I, I included some PDFs of that site, but you can also just go there um, and explore it further. So in, uh, oh, this isn't exactly it. Here we go. So under cellular automata, it's uh, the cellular automata rules lexicon life PDF here. This is um, essentially gives you all of these different rules within this setup. So later, you can kind of plug some of these in to explore it in uh, the tool that um, I put together. And if we go to you know, this person's um, actual page, you can see, yeah, it's like clearly from 2000, but in a very great way. Um, yeah, so all of these sort of like, these are just all families of, of rules. And we're just going to be looking at life and then generations. But you can see that there are like a lot of different varieties of cellular automata that I've only really ex got explored a couple so far. So um, definitely there's a lot more to it. But uh, let's look at how we can make life, the life simulation from our um, elementary automata example. And then from there, we can also add an additional um, change that adds a decay. So after a cell dies, it decays over a period of time before a new cell can be born, which I think that provides some of my favorite rules when you start to get these areas that like decay. And then after they die, other cells can kind of pool to fill in that area. So you get some really interesting uh, dynamics. So uh, I'll close this little visualizer here. Um, we can, you know, for those of you who got the black screen with my like live code, uh, if you can work off of the um, other example, then hopefully you can follow along. It'll work with integers. And then once we get to the decay, we need the float floating values. So um, OK, I've got this open here. Great. So there's a couple of things we don't need in this. One is like that get rule, because we're not going to be passing in rules in that format. So we can delete that and make sure that we also remove that over here on the uh, the vectors. What's it not like? Uh, I don't. It's not giving me any. Oh, it's because I took it away before saving it. There we go. Yeah, it's not going to like this for a second. So you can kind of ignore this um, for a bit. So, all right. Let's also delete like all of this logic because we're not really going to be using that same uh, system here. So I'll delete that. Um, what we want right now, we're only looking at the top three neighbors, but we also want to look at the two adjacent neighbors to the left and right and the bottom three, in addition to think keeping track of the current cell value. So now we actually care about whether the cell is alive or it's dead, because it'll determine whether it, it uses the survival or the birth um, rules. So um, I'll copy this two times and just kind of get those tabs looking a little bit better. Um, and change these names to represent. Uh, in this case, we want, so we've got northwest, north, 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 east. And then we've got east, uh, west, west. Let's just keep going west to east. So west, west. I'm going to use CC to represent the like center or the current cell. And east, east for the like right adjacent. Um, and then also southwest, south, south. Oh, those need to be capitalized, I'm sorry. Um, and southeast, 
Great. So now, in this case, um, these rules are based on like the total number of. So if we have say two neighbors that are alive, we're going to do something different than say if we maybe have three or four. So what we need to know from this information is uh, basically the total um, of all of the neighbors, all those eight neighbors. So we can create a. Um, in this case, I will make it an integer. Well. Yeah, because we're going to eventually make um, use this to look up our rules. But for now, uh, we'll just make it an integer and uh, call this total. So this is we're going to use this to store just like the sum of all the neighbors. So we can type northwest, north north, northeast, west west, east east, all the way down the line. I suppose you could just do this by adding up all of those gets <laughs> without doing this. But I think this is maybe clearer to visualize, um, but you could rewrite it. Uh, so yeah, we should have four different, uh, or sorry, eight different, um, yeah, uh, of those floats. What? No, you don't want to add the center because the rule is only looking at the neighbors. So we'll, we'll use the center in a second to say, uh, yeah, right, actually right now we can do that, where we do want the, um, we're going to do different things based on whether the, set, the the pixel is alive or it's dead, right? So if it's alive, then we need to look at what the conditions are for its survival. If it's dead, we look at the conditions for its birth. Um, so the next thing we can do is create an if statement, and we're going to look at that center value. And if it is, uh, in this case, 1, then we know, OK, we know that our cell is alive. And else, you know, if it's not one, we know that the cell is dead. All right, so good, good so far. And then inside of this, um, we can add a little bit more logic that's going to actually look at saying, OK, well, uh, in the case of Conway's Game of Life, let's just code that in right now before we, we expand it for all of the rules. But we can say, um, if we reference the rule, it should be. Here we go. So it's two, three, three. So that's in a uh, this SB. It's like the survive and the the born. The cells neighbors required for it to do either of those. So um, when it's alive, we're thinking about its survival, whether it's going to die. And so it it's only going to stay alive if that total is equal to two or three. So we can write that right here as an if statement. If total is equal to 2, and then or total equal to 3. And in this case, we'll just set r equal to 1, because we want to keep it alive. Our, so, yeah, our new our, r is our sort of new value for the, um, the cell. And then else r is equal to 0, so this is these need semicolons, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is the, essentially, cell survives. And it's kinda kinda, it kind of helps to keep track of this logic. Um, and this is when the cell dies. All right, so that's all we need for when the cell is currently alive. And we do something very similar uh, if it's dead. So if it's dead, we want to know, OK, is it going to be born now? which it is born if it has three neighbors that are alive. So we can say if the, uh, oops, off. <laughs> if the total is equal to three, then r is going to be equal to one, else r is equal to zero. So essentially this is, uh, this, these, these are if the cell is born, and cell stays dead. Still, you know, it's dead and it's going to just stay that way. So uh, this should, if I save this, switch this over to be, I think there's some other issue that I, what happened here. Oh, okay. Yeah, 27. I did that again. <laughs> um, this, I forgot to add this uh, int to cast the, all of this, like all these floats we're adding up. Um, I'm only doing this because I'll later use it to look up uh, an array. So it needs to be an int. But this could be a float right now. Uh, but we'll, we're kind of working a little bit ahead 
at the same time. So, okay. Um, what's going on here? Did I save the right thing? What's going on? I wonder why that happened. That's interesting. Oh, I know. Uh, one is we need to... That got toggled off somehow. Okay. I think I might have made one error here, so let's see what's going on. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a pretty big one. So <laughs> I <laughs> so we, we copied all of these, but we forgot to change I forgot to change the uh, the neighbors that it's actually looking at in this like northeast north west west center. Right. So um, these represent uh, the northwest, north, north, northeast. But we actually need to change those offsets. So they're looking at the right cells. So um, west west is going to be uh, basically negative one zero. So negative one in the x zero. Center is our zero zero value. East east is one zero. And then this last one, we can move those y values all down neg to negative one in the same way. So negative one, negative one, negative one. And saving that, let's see if this works now. So instead of this rectangle, we can um, go back to sort of just plugging in noise for the moment to see what that does. All right, OK. So yeah, we've got ourselves. This is Conway's game of life, right? So we've expanded it so that they're all looking at their nearest neighbor. Um, and similar, are there, I guess, any questions so far? Any Any issues? Yeah. Can you, I just can't hear you. Speak up. Sure. Yeah, the vectors are under the vector tab. And so you just type the uniform name. That, and then um, correspondingly, if you wanted to say, I didn't actually delete it. So if we wanted to have our rule, we would uniform float and then rule. If it was two values, so if, it w if we wanted to pass in, um, Two, two numbers for a rule, then that would need to be, instead of a float, this would need to be a vec2. It's because there's two values that it's going to be storing, um, all the way up to a vec4. You can delete it. Yeah, I, I just didn't delete the... Um, yeah, this is doing like absolutely nothing right now. Yep. Cool. Other Other questions? Sweet. All right, so um, yeah, one thing I'll do before we, we, eventually we can add the decay, like I talked about, where we'll get some more interesting patterns happening. But first, um, I, wa I want to be able to, in the same way that we could throw that number in and get uh, just like a handy rule, um, I want to be able to pass in that, that rule information without having to go in and change those tables. Um, so I'm going to build about like half of that right now where I'm, we'll, we'll use some table dats to store those values. And then I won't talk about this today, but if you want, you can look at it in the um, CA Explorer, the Cellular Automata Explorer, Explorer talks. There's a Python script that when you type in those like rules in, the, in that slash format, it'll just parse that and, and fill out the table, the dat table. So I'm not going to go deep into the Python today, but... Um, but you know, this is a way that you can at least manually uh, create a dat table to do it. So let's go ahead and do that now. We're, we want to essentially, um, this is like Conway's game of life is cool, but there's all of the, this is all uh, different rules that um, this, uh, I don't actually know how, to, Merrick, um, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he's compiled. Uh, all of these different known rules for this system, and it'd be cool to be able to plug these into the system and see kind of just by you know saying, okay, like what would this diamoeba example look like without having to go through and change the GLSL? So um, really, if you think about it, there are nine possible uh, values that we want to be able to to input. So zero through nine, we could potentially have a rule where, I don't know, it wouldn't be that interesting, but if like zero through nine were all um, represented. So, you know, you might do something if uh, say, there are like zero cells alive around it. So um, we want to include zero. So we'll make these tables, uh, the rows 
one uh n one column and nine rows so we're gonna have zero through nine where this is representing the number of neighbors uh so if this is our survival table i can call this something like s table and if we were gonna create conway ga conway's game of life this would be uh two three for survival so i can say zero zero one one like i said this is sort of half of the tool because in the full example there's like python that can also fill this out without you having to type it in manually but um so that's our survival table and then also uh i can call this b table for the born values this is when it's born uh and conways you're only, they're only born when they have three um neighbors that are alive so we can um there's like different ways to get this in. For a while, I passed it in as like another texture, which I thought was kind of silly after a while. So I, uh, we can do this as just an array, like a chop array. Um, so we'll uh, put this into a null just for good habit and um, then convert this to a chop. And we want this to be one channel. So we'll drop this down and say channel per column, and the first column is also values. So those are the two things you want to change, the output channel per column, and that first column is values. So now we have basically a chop um, channel here that represents our rule for, we can call this uh, S for just survival, and then I'll copy this, and now we've got, uh, just drag this on and change the parameter, dat that it's looking at. Uh, so now we also have one for whether they're uh, born or not. Cool. So we need to now get this into our shader. So we can do this on the uh, arrays page. So for uniform names, I can call this uh, first one S. I'll just call it S rules to keep things not too confusing in our shader and uh, B rules. And then the chops, drag S and B. And then if we, we'll need to also go back into our code here and create uh, uniforms. So in this case, we have a uniform float called S rules that we've, that these names need to match. And in this case, uh, it's an array. So S rules has nine values so this also needs to match like the number of samples that we're passing in so nine here um and we'll do the same for our just copy and paste that for the values that are born um all right so so now we have these tables that just like represent okay like if there are four cells that are alive then we want that to stay keep being alive. So it's kind of like this reference table that we can just look at without having to go through this whole logical setup. Um, we could just say, uh, I'll actually, yeah, just say, um, okay, so instead of if total equals two, in this case, if our, this is our survival, right? So if S rules, and then we're going to look up the uh, like total, like that. that's referring to the sample that we want to look at, right? So if there are three uh, if total is equal to three, then we want to look at the third sample, um, which would really, yeah, be right here. So, uh, so we can just plug total in and reference that directly. So if this is equal to one, then the cell survives, and then otherwise it dies. And then the exact same thing down here. Except we need to change that to B, and let's see if I did it right. Okay, cool. So it stayed Conway, which meant that I should have done it right. And now if we change some of these, um, like I know if we change the first five to ones, let's see, here we go. That gives us like a maze pattern, right? So um, which if you look over here, I think it's just called maze. <laughs> here we go. One, two, three, four, five, and then three. Um, and this is a pretty static uh, texture, but what's kind of interesting about it is if you like subtract from
from it with another input, then it'll fill in that gap. So a lot of these have like different ways that you might try to make them interactive or explore adding like inputs to them. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Jumping around a lot. Uh, wait, there we go. I can also make it a little bigger. Um, yeah, so questions so far about how we like pass those those values in? Yeah, sure. That's totally great. Um, yeah, take a little bit of time. And we, we can take like a short breather after this too before we dive in further. Because uh, we've just been like going for a while. When we, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, and here, I'll turn off that. If you want to see something specific, let me know. I, I hope that that helps. Yeah. Sure. Oh, shoot. That's my. Uh, it's just a. Uh, it's a. One second. I gotta fix this. So that's a. Um, this is a dat to chop. So if you like right click on, like if you, yeah, if you right click on or right click on the output and go dat to, but then you need to change these to, um, you want it to be a channel per column. And also you also have to tell it that the first column are is values. Okay. So there's a couple things you need to change because we're going from this to like the dat data and to I I grabbed these from like so this was from Maze, but you could you could type in different ones. Yeah, explore them. Okay. So yeah. Hey, Oren. Yeah, sure. Cool. I get you kind of messed with the sharpen amount and the blur amount. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, I'm not sure what to mess with on the blur. Um, the filter size. The filter yeah, so bring that down, you start to get, well, yeah, it gets kind of fixly. Kind of fixly yeah. yeah, but uh, there's a certain, well, what resolution is this? Oh, yeah, it's all at 256. Yeah, so, it's just so like increasing it a little bit, you might be able to get a little bit more out of it. This system is a little like more limited, and we'll also look at some like GLSL examples yeah. that uh, are harder because they're harder to like keep stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you can get some like really weird experimental stuff with it, or even stuff that's closer to like Gray Scott mm -hmm. formula. Um, okay. so we'll look at that later and, and I, yeah, if you have like more, I think that, uh, a lot of it is like with the displacement, yeah. um, making that, mo uh, not monochrome and like increasing yeah. the resolution and like the pixel depth totally. will help. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, about the convolution tables. Do you yeah. Go into, do you actually go into yeah, you can edit that directly too. Yeah. So, um, like one thing I'll sometimes do is like add an evaluate and scale them. You and it's like you know, especially if you're trying to use bigger, like larger filters on the blur. Yeah. Scaling this up, like by two, for instance, will still stay stable, but it'll sharpen it like twice as much. Okay, so they're all like negative two instead of three. Negative yeah, it'd be like negative twos, and then yeah. and then um double that too, so sixteen. Okay. But uh, but you can play with like you know setting the corners to slightly different weights, and then making sure that the outer weights and the inner weight when you add them are like close to zero. Mm -hmm. But then like you can always add other things in the network, like if that's not stable you could add like a level that like brightens it slightly right so you can yeah. use tops to do all sorts of like experiments in math um yeah, yeah. so like i've gotten interesting things by multiplying uh it together and then brightening it later or you know and it's kind of like a contrast a little bit but then at the same time gives you very different results that are sometimes hard to yeah. reproduce you have to just experiment a lot i think oh sweet yeah cool yeah, no problem. Cool. More questions? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, I'll be right over. Um, I don't know exactly what it was. It must have been something slightly different that I did when making it than the example. But um, did you open up, if you open up the wolfram.talks, it still, that works? No, no, that works. It's just because like, uh, the first time I did it, I had it, so I was like always 
good. And just like before you get the, the rules from the array, the second time I compiled and it was not working, but everything seems to be just black. And that's showing up as black too? Yeah, exactly. Uh, huh. I pulled the, the feedback and nothing was there. So Does the, um, yeah, huh. It's really weird. And I, I mean, it's probably something really tiny that I like yeah. can't but point to. Yeah, I don't know if it didn't use the code uh, actually or just the In the top network somewhere? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, you could try making sure that interpolate pixels is off. On the, um, All of the tops. Yeah. That actually might be it, to be honest. Um, that's all of yeah, let me know if that works, because if that's it, then that actually, because that actually is going to be blurring the pixels together a little bit. So, um, yeah, let me know, and then I can make an announcement if that works. Yeah. Yeah. One or more is not successfully compiled. Oh, and you're on a Mac, so let's see. Oh, uh, um, yeah, it might want this to be swizzled. I guess I like, or am I doing that? Um, I think I changed that, which might actually be the issue. Uh, well, let's see. Oh, you're in, you're over here. What's it? Um. So you could try making this like a color and then um, like the, I always forget this one, but the mouse wheels. Like it comes in with the, uh, this like if you set it up to T TD output swizzle, that actually might do it because this is supposed to be better for cross platforms. And if you have certain like graphics cards, it won't, so we want to set the color equal to this and then the output instead to our TD output swizzle color. I'm not fast at using your computer. But if you put the VEC4 up there, that line. Yeah, one second. Sorry. And then uh, try, see if that works. No, didn't work. OK. It could be, but I have, so I tested these on Mac, so it should work. It's possible I did something slightly, slightly different this, like, run. Uh, oh, here we go, else 42. Uh, oh, okay, so let's see, where is that? To if, oh, um, so these need to be, so we've got if, and then this if and else. It looks like there's an extra um, bracket. So maybe like this can kind of help look at it. Uh, and then this else should be closed. Right, so we make sure all of these brackets are closed. And tabbing it helps a little bit keep track. So then this one's closed down. So this is, uh, ah, OK. That's the error. Great. So yeah, just some extra, uh, is it command S on here or is it control? Well, do you want to save that? Just to see if it, what does it say? Unidentified. Oh, uh, yeah. It probably doesn't like it that we just like created color out of the blue either. S rules. Oh, okay. And then also we need to um, add a couple things at the top to get the rule S rules in. So you see how like it's uh, S rules total equals equals one. I know it's a little hard to see. But if you set that and then also we need to declare those at the top. So I'll scroll it up so you can see it in a second. Ah, I need to just like clip this on to me. <laughs> oh, cool. 
Uh, were there other questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. One second. I just want to move this up. So, um, oops. So these uh, top two lines here are so that you can declare that those um, floats. Yeah, those uh, arrays. And then, so I can keep that there if you want to see that. Cool. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's basically like we have our current pixel. U v u v dot s t is like the current location in. Yeah. Right. So if it's like a a a, rec a square, mm -hmm. zero zero is the bottom left. Yeah. One one is the top right, and so, that yeah, helps yeah. us determine where the pixel is. Um, and then what we're doing is we're saying, okay, like in this case, for negative one one, we're passing those two in as x and y. So we're adding to where we currently are, like negative one and one. But what is the current current point? Current point? It, it could be. Um, it's going to be different for every pixel. So like the way that this runs is every pixel is going to calculate the same thing at the same time, <laughs> right? So it's all like it's just like it, it, yeah. There you go. Sweet. Um, yeah. Oh, I just had to remember that rule. Sure. It's um, like different rules. Yeah, there's a PDF in that folder called um, Game of Life Lexicon. Yeah, so like in this case, one, two, three, four, five, slash three, you put one, two, three, four, five in the first one and three in the second. And then like, so you see how uh, there is like the first five are ones and then in the second one, the third is a one. Three is one, so that's that's referencing this maze. But if you wanted to do, um, yeah, let's just can you do the maze as an example? Yeah, if you go back, I think you have it actually with the rules because you typed it. It looks like you. Yeah, it looks like you have it because this is one, two, three, four, five. Oh, except zero. We don't turn on zero, and that will give you. It's almost the same though. You know, you could pulse the feedback. I mean, it'll give it a new seed. That's cool though, with like one point and it kind of grows outwards. Sure. Um, I just want to understand the logic of how we join in these things. So oh, okay. That means, yeah, um, that means that if, for instance, this first table, um, that's determining whether the cell survives. Yeah. So, like, if it's one, two, three, four, if a cell is alive, then. It will continue to be alive if it has one, two, three, or four neighbors that are also alive. So all of those different conditions. Um, but then it, if it's dead, it will only become alive if it has exactly three neighbors that are alive. Oh yeah, some of them use zero, but like very few. So it's in there, but. Um, yeah, it's a little easier to type them in if you go to the, like the rule explorer that we'll look at in a moment, but because it kind of does it all for you. Yeah, I don't think it makes a big difference when you change. Sometimes you'll change something and it doesn't vary a lot, but if you start to plug in some other rules, there's some really different. Um, we'll we'll look at some more soon. So. It's the same same kind of deal. So like if three is the only value then three is the only one that has a one and everything else is zero, right? Because that's saying like, it's only going to be born. There you got something a lot different, right? So um, yeah, and you can, there's like s some interesting rules in, in this life gen um, ex version, but then once we add like the decay, you start to get some really kind of other crazy results too. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Black screen. Did um did that work to change the interpolation? No, okay. 
Yeah, it looks like you have that. No, nearest pixel. Okay. Cool, cool. All right. Well, let's see. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's just to keep it. So that like is referring to um, it's like a uniform in touch that touch designer that returns the width over one and the height over one. Or sorry, no, opposite. One over the height and one over the width. So it's like the fraction of the width and the height that gives us like one pixel essentially. Yeah. So because we need to. Um, we need to multiply that tiny. Essentially, like it's like if we had four pixels, one over uh, four is going to give us 0.25, and that's the increment that we want to move. So instead of moving one, because like we're we're working in normalized coordinates, so we need to move like a fraction of that. Yeah. So this is just that fraction in the x and the y fraction that we multiply by one. So that's why we can move the exact right amount, and if the resolution changes, we don't have to change these values. Cool. 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 Okay, so um, so there's um, if I get your attention, maybe we can do like add the um, the decay, which is just like the one other addition to the system that we'll do, and then I'll show you the tool that lets you like, explore these in a, with like a UI, so you don't have to necessarily go in and change these tables and so forth, which I think could be really reusable, and you don't necessarily have to, to go in and edit all of this stuff. Um, but first, um, this uh, addition to the uh, system gives us what's called generation. So we've been just working in like the classic life example, but these generations rules, you'll notice that um, we're adding one like additional Im uh, value. So this is the, uh, this C stands for count, and it has to do with, let's say like a cell dies. We can add a number of frames that it decays before it's um, available for another cell to be born in that space. So if it dies and, and the decay is 10, it's gonna take 10 frames and get sort of dimmer. And then eventually once it's zero, that cell is fully dead, right? So it's this kind of like intermediary state, but it creates some really, um, as I said earlier, some really like interesting patterns where you have like sections that fill in and out um, based on when they die. So um, so we can look about at, look at how to do this, uh, and it's pretty s simple to add to our existing uh, shader. So one thing we need is a new vector, which we can just call C that stands for count or you could call it count if you want, but, um, and then this, we can just set it to, to, I don't know, 20 for now, but we'll change it in a moment. Um, and we'll wanna make sure we declare this in our shader too. So we'll type uniform float C. And um, there's a couple things we wanna change to do this. So the first, it, it's all really in our rules at the bottom. So where we're, we're figuring out when it's alive and whatnot. Um, instead of this first conditional looking at when the cell is alive, we can actually just look at um, when it's not dead. So because there's gonna be an intermediary state when it's decaying. Uh, and so in this case, we'll say C is greater than zero. Oop, sorry. And so this will now give us cells that are both alive, but also cells that have died and haven't quite they haven't fully died yet. Um, they're still decaying. And um, now for it to survive, it needs to, not only does it do the um, neighbors need to satisfy the rule because we're still dealing with survival, like that survival rule, but we also, so I'm gonna type in and here, uh, that value needs to also be one. So it needs to be alive for it to survive, right? Once it's decayed, it's just going to keep like decaying until it's zero. So I'm also gonna say, and 
my current value is equal to one. Um, and now our else, the, the only thing we need to change here is instead of just setting it to zero, um, every time it comes through, we want to subtract a little bit more from the current value based on, and, and the amount that we want to subtract is uh, one divided by C. Because if we want it to last for, if we're starting at an initial value of one and we want it to last for 20 frames, we want to subtract 1 20th each frame, right? So that'll give us 20 frames until it gets to zero and it's fully dead. Um, so in this case, R, we can set equal to the current value, right? So we want to actually reference what the current value is and subtract this one over C. And I believe that's it actually. Um, so we don't see anything really happen yet because this is a relatively stable system, but we can go and check out uh, one of these rules here. And then I'll, I'll put the code back up in a second. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of uh, this one called Thrill Grill at the bottom. I think this is like probably one of my favorites. It's a one, two, three, four, three, four, and then it has a decay of 48. So I'll change my C to 48 um, and adjust these rules. So we want one, two, three, four. I don't actually need zero there. So one, two, three, four, and three and, uh, was it three and four? And let's see if it actually worked. Actually something, uh, okay. So there's some stuff happening here, but let's actually pulse our feedback. Okay, now it's kind of like doing something interesting. And uh, if we pulse this, okay, wait, what's going on? I think I did this previously. Uh, oh, really, yep, yeah, there's one more thing we need to do. So this is actually very important. So having the decay uh, changes our, West, north, 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 east inputs because now we're, instead of getting one or zero for life or death, we're getting these fractions, right? And that's actually throwing our total off quite a bit because we're not gonna get whole, whole values. So what we can do is for everything except for CC, because CC we wanna have that fraction, right? That we need to know what the decay is, but for all of the neighbors, uh, we'll take the floor. So I'm, I'm hitting control in Sublime and clicking multiple times and I'm gonna type floor. So what floor does is it, um, this gives us basically rounds down to the nearest integer. So if we have 0.5, it's gonna give us zero. But if we have one, we'll have one, like 1.5 will go down like to the floor, is, you can remember it. Um, cool, and then I'll add these additional parentheses. Yep, so. I like sometimes forget that, uh, so save that. So now if we pulse, let's see, did I actually save? Oh, there we go. So now we, we're getting some um, kind of like interesting growth patterns here. Where are you setting uh, Sorry, I went quickly. Um, so in the GLSL top under the vectors, we've added, we just added C. I did that pretty quickly, but type C here. This is where we're uh, changing that value. And then we make sure that our uniform is also defined here. Cool, so, um, so that's how we can start to like add some different variations to these rules. And I'm sure that there's probably more you could expand this system if you, if you get into it. Um, but I also want to sh show you there's a tool in here called CA Explorer. Uh, so this, let's kind of look a little bit closer. Um, is really just made for being able to actually go up a level so we're not looking at that. Um, so this is essentially like that same code, right? So you can see here's our, our tables with rules and C and then the code is ostensibly the same. Um, but it does have a little bit of a kind of a UI here that lets you save and like edit rules and kind of switch between different seeds. So for instance, if we wanted to load Conway, we could click Conway. Um, so any, any traditional life rules, we want to just have one for the decay. Because if you think about it, it should just decay in like immediately, right? One over one, 
it's gonna just die right off. Um, but you get a lot of these other patterns that can provide some really interesting uh, results. And these are again, like they're all defined with the same, uh, by this syntax, it's like two, three, like number slash number slash number, which is the survival birth and count information. So if we say wanted to say, okay, we've got thrill grill, but we wanted it to take less time to decay. We could just type in 20 and see what that looks like. And now, okay, now, so it moves a little bit faster because the cells are decaying faster. Um, and if we like that, we might call it, you know, version two and save it. And now we can kind of switch between those two rules here. Or if you really hate a rule, you could delete it and it'll, it'll warn you <laughs> so you don't accidentally delete all your rules. Uh, it usually just jumps to the top after you delete a rule. So um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things like uh, faders is kind of an interesting one. It creates these sort of like, I don't even know how to describe them. They're moving like zigzags of sorts. Uh, of course we looked at maze already. Um, and then again, like I haven't even added all of the examples that are here. So I've gone through a fair number, but there's more to be found here. And there are more rules that you can discover by just like playing with the values. So, um, so I find it to be really cool. And, and again, like we'll talk a little bit later about how we can take some of these textures and use them to either like add interactivity to them or this one's the hardest maybe to make interactive, but, um, but, or drive other kind of generative textures. Um, cool. So any questions about the um, cellular automata? That's about as far as I'll go with that system. Um, how, let's see, we have maybe an hour and 15 minutes left. Uh, do people want like a short break? I know we kind of breaked earlier, but do you want a short break before we dive in or should we just keep going? Keep going, cool, okay. So, um, I did mention that I wanted to, I'm not gonna go through the full building process of this one cause it's like about the same thing that we just did except with uh, reaction diffusion, but I'll go through the GLSL and talk through what's going on. Um, so this is um, in the example files here in reaction diffusion um, under the GSL examples. There are three, I'll close this file now. Great. Uh, okay, so um, this should look somewhat familiar to what we were doing in the first uh, go, but it's a little bit, we actually have three examples here. Um, so one of these is, like the first two use the, um, this Gray Scott formula, which if we look over here, it's this like, and I won't spend too much time talking about this, but it's definitely worth exploring a little bit um, further. But uh, this first one is kind of like between the two examples that we, the first example we looked at and actually implementing this because it does use a blur in the system as well. Um, so I found that like adding the blur helps stabilize it a little bit, whereas the, um, Example below here, it's moving a lot slower. It doesn't have, it's essentially the same kind of deal, right? So we have a, um, a feedback top, a GLSL, a null, nothing else in this loop. So it's not actually blurring it at all uh, or sharpening it, right? That's all kind of happening in, the info is all, it's all happening in the shader. And um, this actually, we're not looking at this example on the right. So if we, <laughs> I have to switch this here, but, uh, um, yeah, I found that without that blur, this shader specifically is really, really easy to, it's like easy for it to be unstable and just to like completely turn black or white based on really um, like specific values. You'll see these are like 0 0.064, 0 0.028, which are the like feed and the kill rates for one, um, you know, like uh, the chemical one might be feeding in at a certain rate and then chemical B not one and B, but A and B. So B would be then uh, like dying off at a different rate. And, and these are really finicky. So if we change these like even a tiny bit, it's just gone, right? So um, it's very easy to like really challenging. I found to like narrow down uh, values. So it takes a lot of like tweaking small amount, um, small values. Whereas this example here, 
Um, the blur helps stabilize it quite a bit, but you're not going to get the same kind of like level of detail necessarily. Um, so that's just like a quick like caveat as like I've been sort of exploring how to implement these myself. Um, and this bottom example is a uh, similar to the top one, but it's an attempt at a, it's like doing a three component simulation. So instead of just two chemicals, we have like three colors happening. Um, and so I'll, I'll look at the code, at least in this one. Uh, it, this one's exactly the same, actually. The, the, sh the um, like the shaders are exactly the same in these two. The only difference really is that this one on the top has a blur in the network. And uh, so if we open this up, I'll just talk through a little bit about what's happening. Um, so if we reference this uh, formula, this is actually happening in the code right here. So we have, uh, it's kind of at the bottom, but you can see that we've got this sort of like DA, which is, um, let's see, that would be the, that's that we're creating the, um, like A and B are two chemicals. And so we've got RA, which stands for the rate of diffusion, um, feed and kill, which is this F and K, right? So this is like the uh, sub chemical, that sub like the rate of subtraction of chemical B and feed is the rate of um, addition of chemical A. And then um, this Laplacian function, if you recall, we were doing that convolve top earlier that's basically like you have a matrix and its nearest neighbors are just like added based on weighting. Um, so that's essentially what this is, it's a three by three convolution with center weight negative one and adjacent neighbors 0.2, diagonals 0.05. Um, and I found that, I think that I didn't ever really get one that was stable using that exact those exact values. We can look here, um, I'm somewhere close to it actually. So I pulled out those variables as uh, uniforms so I can d d define um, the center weighting, diagonal weightings, which is like, are the diagonal neighbors and then the adjacent neighbors. So uh, this one right here, it, it doesn't really show us on the right what we're looking at, um, is the one that's a little, is very hard to get stable. And uh, it's close to what, um, you know, is suggested in si Carl Sims tutorial, but I think it's it's the hardest to keep stable. Um, and this top one, you'll see that uh, those same weightings are completely different. So I just sort of tweak those to find things that uh, balance. Um, so you can play with them in different ways, but the r really interesting thing about doing this in GLSL is that instead of, um, you know, that first example where we had the blur, the rate of diffusion between A and B was pretty much the same because the blur was indiscriminate. It didn't care which was uh, black or white. It just like pulled it together at the same rate. Um, but this can really look at uh, when we're treating like A, and, uh, red and green as our A and B chemicals and then um, using this formula to actually, you know, do the diffusion, um, we can input, say this uh, second input is a uh, separate input for feed and, and kill rates so that we can define that in different areas um, in our output. So if we go inside here, there's some different things happening, but if we say pull out these noise inputs, you'll see that this ramp that's moving is actually defining, um, you know, as this ramp is moving, it's defining the feed and the kill rate. And we're getting like different patterns basically based on, um, you know, these values. So I find this is like a lot of fun to play with and you get a lot of really interesting things as you start to vary these different um, patterns. And you can imagine, say like, if this was instead, uh, a connect texture. I actually don't have a connect today because it doesn't, mine has stopped working with my laptop for some reason. But um, <laughs> but uh, you can imagine if you had like a silhouette that you captured through a depth camera and you were able to say then, okay, well, it needs to be, you know, a value of green data coming in here. This is a 32 bit, I think, no, 16. So yeah, 16 bit um, float. You know, you could use that to, to use sort of live video input to drive, say, where the chemicals are you know more um, you know feeding in more or decaying more? So uh, I won't spend too much time, kind of like going through this code, but you you can certainly 
it's a really similar idea because we are like the cellular automata, we are looking at kind of like neighboring pixels and using that to kind of like combine it with the current value to get the, the next value. So it's kind of this like feedback loop simulation. Um, the three component version was a kind of a funny thing because I really wanted a third. I was like, there's gotta be a way to add a third chemical, but I didn't know like an, it's the um, Gray Scott formula only deals with two. So I poked around forever and found um, a paper that talked about it and uh, managed to like input this this other formula. So I basically extended this to be RGB instead of red and green. And uh, this this equation here deals with basically like weighting against each other. So each form, um, so actually in the, uh, let's see where it is. Okay, so these like weight U, W, U, W, V, and W, W are actually weights of each chemical in relation to all the other chemicals. Um, so say like it, we changed, uh, with our weight W to like four, we might see more, um, or less green, right? So we can start to play with these to get some different effects. Um, and also this has a, uh, rates for each color too. So like right now green, uh, or sorry, red has a rate of one, uh, green is 1.2, red is Sorry, I probably just, uh, blue is 1.4, but if we change these, you know, you'd see um, some changes happen and they're pretty subtle, so you don't want dramatic changes necessarily. Um, but then this is also, it also has a um, kind of like an input, which I think is, uh, let's see, I have to remember what that is actually doing. I think it's just adding some additional noise to uh, the rates. So this rate has, you could you could decide to, augment the rate with uh, sort of red, green, and blue values too. So um, I just wanted to include these. They're like a little more advanced, but certainly they can be like starting points or you can explore how they work and playing with them. Um, I guess any questions about these specifically? Yeah. Oh, you mean like what would I pull out here into the vectors to play with? Um, yeah, I think sometimes it's like in this case, uh, a lot of it's like just sort of like, you know, I might be playing in the shader and then I'm and I'll be tweaking values in the code. And if I find a value that's like, oh, if I change this, it makes something really interesting happen. That will be maybe more likely. I'll say, like, well, why don't I just uh, pull that out into a uniform? so that I could potentially control it with something else. Yeah, any, uh, pretty much anything. I think there's probably some exceptions, but like, um, but yeah, if it's like a, if it's like a float value that you're manipulating in the shader or, or a vec too. I mean, like these are all floats, but it could be like an integer too. If it's like some of these others are like rules, right? We've pulled out like integer values that change things as well. Um, but yeah, I, usually it's just, you know, you vary a value and it's like makes something interesting happen and you're like, oh, that's something that I might want to see what happens if I use audio amplitude to make that do something, right, to change. Um, so yeah, does that, that help? Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, probably. I haven't really explored it too much. I mostly, I mean, if you want it to go faster, you could try just like upping your frame rate or something like that, or saving, like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if how you, some of these might have like rates for instance, but that also has to do with like, is very coupled to the stability of the system. Um, certainly with the cellular automata tool, there's, I have like a, a, a sort of a thing built in that can slow it down because sometimes I find slowing it down is actually more useful than speeding it up, which is really just like a cache top that has an LFO attached to it that just like pulses at 60 FPS, but you can bring it down if you want. Um, but uh, a caveat to that is I noticed that if you then input like interactive, like like elements that are at 60 frames per second into the system to interact with it, you kind of have to like get rid of the cache top, 
because it conflicts in terms of like you're adding all this input, but not only like grabbing the frame at half the rate or something like that. So that is something that, um, you know, I'll point out when we're talking about the interactive stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, right. Any, so yeah, these are, yeah, as I said, like, I don't know, I've been working on them for a while, so I hope you guys like find something useful from them. I, I think there's still more to be done to them to like, this one's pretty close, but like the, especially the Gray Scott one, it's like neither of these actually really look like all of these patterns, right? So it's hard to um, kind of do in ways, but uh, I found it to be like pretty challenging to totally recreate these. So certainly I fit, these are sort of my first steps, my steps towards that, at least in, in shaders. Um, there's a lot of really crazy stuff people do. Hey, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's right here. So in this case, I, I decided that like I wanted to have uh, both a texture coming in, but also an additional um, uniform to like augment that as just a quick way to like if I didn't have uh, I didn't want to use a texture input. I could also just tweak that with, uh, so it's adding these two floats, which could be zero, right? And also adding, uh, basically it's just like my, my feet, my, um, uh, sorry, feed and kill rates are represented as red and green values as an input. So that's something that like for me really changed the way I think about using touch designer is thinking about pixel values, not just as color, but as data. And like saying like, okay, well, this red value actually represents the feed and the green represents the kill rate. And then I'll feed that into the shader and each pixel is gonna be just referencing that point on the input. So that's how we can say, uh, in this case, that ramp directly corresponds to this output because each section is just looking at the change in the texture. Um, so that, yeah, that's sort of like how I, I think about it and how I sort of like, like for instance, um, I don't do this in this workshop, but I have sometimes uh, with cellular automata, it's like I want maybe a portion of the image to be one rule and another portion to be a different rule. And you could input a, um, a texture that's just like binary, right? Black and white, where, where it's black, it, it just does one rule. When it's white, it does a different rule, right? And then you can have these edge spaces where it's going between them. So, um, so yeah, you can think about like what you can represent as as pixel data, I think, and, and especially if you dive deeper into things like particle systems or you know processing geometry, but in tops, you'll you'll get to like go deeper <laughs> into that. Um, cool. So yeah, um, we'll, we I, I'll probably won't spend more time on this, but if you have more questions on on these, I'm happy to like talk more after. But I do want to touch on some of the. Um, kind of like basic interactive examples and uh, ways of actually also like driving more, I don't know, generative content with this. Um, so I was just gonna close this and we, I'm just gonna also like in the interest of time, like look at some of these examples, but not necessarily recreate all of them. So, uh, so there's two folders here. One is generative and one is interactive where the generative is just like, it's not actually taking any inputs. Um, so, this one actually might, you might want to disable the, there's some screen space ambient occlusion that could slow things down. So you can also disable that if you want. I'm going to wait for it to open. Uh, here we go. So this is just an example of, I've actually also got the mouse input here too. Um, but of how we can say, take this texture, this reaction diffusion texture and apply it as a material, a PBR material. So in this case, uh, I am going to actually like, Running this on my desktop is a lot different than my laptop, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, okay, there we go. So not quite as nicely shaded, but um, running smoothly. So this is where you could say take like the um, texture and bring it in, apply a normal mapping, um, use the black and white values as a height map. So you know, you're know you enabling the height map, dragging in this uh, texture and you can change things like the display scale in the material. Um, so there's a lot, I, I like using this a lot cause it's just like a quick way that you can use like a 
flat texture to make uh, geometry. And certainly, um, this doesn't have to be a grid, too. So, you know, certainly if you add like a sphere, um, and these are to get the high resolution, you know, this is a one, like there's a lot of points in this. It's like 1000, it's even 1080 by 1080. So um, they're pretty big. But if we say we wanted to try applying this to a sphere, it's not going to look perfect right away, probably. But um, let's see, okay, well, we're, we're inside of it at the moment. But um, let's see where the camera is at. Here we go. Yeah, so it would need more work to really like polish it, right? So I'll have to tweak it in like different ways, but um, you can see how, um, you know, you start to be able to supply these textures to uh, geometry, right? So certainly, you know, there's more, more to be done to get it to look, you know, you have to kind of tweak little parameters to get the look where you want it. Um, and this is, uses a lookup for the color. So I, I, I like to use that when I'm dealing with like black and white textures. Um, it's really dark, so I also need to maybe, I don't know, there's some different things we would need to do to uh, brighten this up. But yeah. So uh, so yeah, that's, and then again, like we could use um, cellular automata too. It's like the same, same deal. So a lot of these could be, you know, we could switch this uh, input, right? And, and really look at whatever you want as uh, like a material. Um, and again, like swap, you could fade between colors. So there's all sorts of stuff you can do to start to get, um, yeah, to start like using this to drive something that's generative. Um, questions on this? I'll, I'll kind of keep moving through the examples unless there are, are questions. Um, one thing that I found really fun is using like the motion or, of these systems to drive things like particle systems. So to do this, um, we're gonna, I use this really useful uh, object that you can find in the palette, which is optical flow. And so this is actually using two things from the palette. Um, one is, they're both under tools. And so one is, uh, it's like optical flow and particles GPU are like right next to one another. And they actually play really well together because the particle system has an in that takes in optical flow. And, and just so you get an idea of what optical flow is, um, it's a little bit hard to see, it's like really dim, but essentially what it does is uh, analyzes the motion of pixels and provides um, red and green values uh, that are actually, you know, some of these are negative because it's, um, I think it's a 32-bit float, so it's gonna be like a pretty high definition. Um, oops, sorry. And uh, yeah, so this is, this is interesting because it's basically like taking you know, your, your video and providing something that represents the motion um, as data, but, and, and as color channels. And so this input, you can see how my, um, you know, reaction diffusion system is providing, kind of like pushing the particles around instead of just drawing them there. And so if we change, say like the, uh, increase the force here, actually a better place to do it would be on the um, particle GPU. There's a uh, input magnitude so if we increase this, you get you know quite a bit more motion from the inputs, uh, and certainly, again, like there's some like this is like a, a different pattern here. We could um, you know use cellular automata instead, right? So or like really anything you want, um, and that's what's kind of fun about it is you can just plug in different things. Uh, additionally, it doesn't have to be a grid like as the source, right? So it has a SOP source, and right now it's just drawing a grid. But uh, one thing that's kind of interesting too is to say take something like, uh, we could use any geometry we want, but like if we took this sphere and made it a uh, polygon of relatively low frequency and then throw this in, um, we get sort of a different, different look. I think even the, yeah, so we kind of get the geometry in there, but also these sort of picks, like particles that are flowing off of it in a way that's, basically rep like resembles our our video input um so definitely kind of a like a fun thing to explore and there's a lot of uh sort of different iterations i've done on this as well um so those are the two there's a lot more but those are like the two examples that i i've found like a lot of different iterations uh possible um and certainly like this 
tools is, is a nice like starting point if you want to say dive into something like a GPU particle system, um, like exploring that uh, that shader and like modifying it is how I figured out kind of started to get a feel for working with shaders period is like, oh, how do I make the particles attract to a certain spot or so forth. So I think it's like worth checking out that system because it's a fully fledged like simulation basically in it in itself. Um, cool. So the other th few examples here are just a couple like interactive examples. Um, pretty simple ones. I like the, this is like camera one also uses optical flow. Um, just quit these there. Okay. So, oh, here I am. So here we go. So this is, uh, basically like using the camera input to displace, uh, the reaction diffusion. So I have this kind of like optical, maybe it's kind of hard to see in here. Um, could maybe be a little bit more, uh, pushing it around a little bit more. So it's even like increase that a little bit, but, um, Basically, like if I move my hand, it's hard to see the ripples really. Uh, let's make this a little more intense. There we go. So yeah, now it basically like any motion from say a camera input, right, can be used to, um, as just basically like an input to a displaced top like you would when we were just adding noise, right? So our noise was basically, that was red and, um, green values that were displacing the pixels, but we could drive that from something else like this optical flow. Um, so mostly what's happening in here is there's just a little bit of a feedback network that adds the, the flow because otherwise, and, and blurs it a little bit, which I found smoothed it out a little bit and gives you kind of these trails, right? So if you have like a feedback loop where you're also grabbing the motion, then if you move your hand things are gonna keep moving after your hand moves, which is kind of this like interesting trail effect. Um, so I found that to be uh, useful. And then this one's very, like I found that adding input to like the cellular automata systems is a lot trickier, um, but this is kind of the same idea, except I have to basically like, because this is giving me, um, negative and positive values. Like I really just want to know, is it moving or is it not? Because I need to turn it into a black and white image. So I take uh, all of the data, I make it positive and I'm, I'm doing some like ranging in here too, which I should probably break out for understanding. But if we look at uh, this little target, it does tell us like what I, what's been changed in the tops uh, so, or any operators. So we can see, okay, I made it positive and multiply it by 10. Um, monochrome, because it needs to be black and white. Uh, level, I invert it because I'm, at the end, I'm multiplying the textures. So I want, where there's no motion, I want that to be white so that it doesn't affect it. Um, and then this last bit, I change it to an 8-bit texture just because that's matching, um, you know, my cellular automata stuff. It's actually 16-bit, but, uh, so you could probably make it, as long as it's fixed and not negative, it should be fine. Um, but yeah, so you can kind of see where there's some different um, like examples uh, that work well with this in the cellular automata. So mostly stuff that's going to like fill in spaces after you subtract it, I found work well. Um, so like the maze is also pretty good because I can move and then it slowly fills in the spaces that are gone. Um, and this is, this is a pretty similar right here. This example is pretty similar to the, um, there's also like a mouse or like I have a leap motion, which I could plug in, but uh, it's a very similar, you know, you have X and Y uh, positions, but uh, right now this is just with a mouse. So you can see how say um, you could also use kind of any sort of like X, Y, Z position. And in this case, it's the same principle. Um, there's a little bit, uh, like our mouse input right here, there's, we've got our mouse and um, I'm really just drawing a circle at that position and using the slope chop so that I'm only, uh, you know, I'm increasing the, the alpha is, is being driven by how fast my mouse is moving. That way, if I'm not moving my mouse, it's not subtracting anything. And if I move it, we draw a line. So kind of a nice use of like 
the slope uh, slope chop to do that. And then um, a little bit of feedback here. Uh, and, and this works really similar in both of the systems. As long as the systems are going to expand to fill in space, you can, um, you know, there's a lot of ways, there's like different ways you can uh, add inputs, whether it's like additive or subtractive. Um, so that's something, you, you know, definitely worthwhile exploring. Um, cool. And I think that the only other one is this audio reactive, which honestly, uh, pretty similar to some of the other stuff. Um, it, it basically analyzes the audio and then uses that to push the um, system around using noise. So there's certainly other ways you could do this, but again, a lot of the ways that we're, you're not hearing this, but you all know this one because it's like the default kind of like track that always plays. So you can imagine it happening to this. Um, but uh, I'm using a, um, you could use the, the palette tool. I, I'm just like been a long time fan of this uh, beat follower that you can find on the forum and also in this example. So you can just copy it from here too. But uh, I like the kind of like line, the trail visualization and being able to sort of move the um, uh, bandpass filter around and so forth. So, uh, so yeah, I like th these tools are nice, but you know, however you want to get that amplitude, whether it's MIDI triggers or from like other data, um, in this case, I'm just using it to drive the amplitude of the noise, which then kind of pushes the, it's like it's just a way to push pixels around based on that um, amplitude and, and a pretty straightforward way to set it up. Um, so yeah, I think that that's pretty much it for those examples. So we can probably spend the rest of the time if you guys want to explore some of these examples or ask more questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. In some minutes. Sure. The source seed? Yeah. You mean like the. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, so you want to like have a, a source image and then the fusion is sort of building around that in some way. Um, I think that I, I would mostly go to those. Like you could do it with the sort of blur sharpen technique if you wanted to, but I, I, what I really built, like why I went down the rabbit hole of figuring out the GLSL examples is because you have those feed and kill rate inputs. So, um, and you know, so you know, I have like the ramp that was moving through and it was green textures. Let's just like open that up again. Um, uh, yeah. So like if we wanted it to be a circle or something else, we would, you know, if you had a source image, you would need to sort of convert that to basically just a green or a red channel and, and tweak that a little bit to control this um, output. So let's go up a level. I don't have like an ex a good example, but we could say, um, go in here. Like if we wanted this to be a circle instead, um, like let's say you did have it as like a white value we could use something like channel mix or other other operators of that variety um, and just take away the red and the green. And we could even, you know, use those to, to create, uh, what am I doing? It's the blue. Uh, we want it to be um, just green. So yeah, you, you would tweak this to basically get your green, green value. I don't know, I'm not thinking totally straight here. Uh, here we go. So you might have your green, your convert your image to green. Um, you want to make sure that like the resolution matches to a degree. I mean, it, it doesn't exactly need to, but probably like the, at least the aspect ratio. Um, but then if we just plug this into this, is like just uh, really just adding all of this together. And you'll note that it's, uh, it's 16 bit fixed. So a lot of these values can actually be like greater than, like some of these are, could, could it potentially exceed um, one? Uh, and you might see some weird artifacts happen if you exceed values enough, but uh, like if we plug this in, uh, there we go. So yeah, I mean, you can see how that's sort of subtracting an area. Um, but if we made this red, it would do something different. Uh, actually that totally wipes it out, but you know, changing all of these values, um, oh, there's some weird stuff, yeah. 
you, you can start to like say use input input textures to control that. Um, oh yeah, we're still getting the ramp right. So like the more we take out of this right, like the less we get, we can get a lot more. Uh, yeah, and then again, like this value can be decreased too. So you could have it be very faint. Um, Yeah. Right. Oh, you want to like color the simulation itself? Um, I think that might have to be, I mean, you could try to do it in the, I don't have a quick way to do it off the top of my head. So you might experiment, but yeah, I, you could also do it in post. Like I've sometimes done this in the blur sharpen method, uh, for instance, like let's see if we go Let's open that up because this is actually kind of an interesting question. Um, is uh, in the basic example, we're we're dealing with a black and like a monochrome input, right? Um, and I don't know if this will directly answer your question, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so if we had say changed our input instead of being monochrome to RGB and pulsed this. It will still work. It's just like we have three simulations happening at once, essentially, one on each channel. And if we split them out, we could recolor them. So using like the channel mix, if we just say I only want my red channel all the way down. So I'm just gonna take red and make it my like red, green, blue, alpha. So we even have alpha here too. Um, we did that for each we would have basically three like simulations that are all using the same kind of parameter, but they're slightly different. And then if we multiply these by say a color, you could have uh, two that are like similar colored, but like overlaid, but you can really have control over those colors too. Um, so I don't know if that kind of gets at it at all, but yeah, it, it's something I've done from time to time. So it's, what am I doing? Typing in color, <laughs> constant. You can tell it's been like a three day workshop or three, <laughs> three days of workshops. Uh, yeah, so you can see how like I could recolor this and then composite it maybe by using like over. Just, and so now this one's pretty dense, but like if you had some of these that were less dense, you could start to have like multiple, um, you know, like they're all being driven by the same parameters, which means they're going to have some similarity throughout. Um, yeah, cool. Other other questions? Or? Not. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just try to find like examples and resources, and like sometimes I try to read papers, but half the time they're over my head. Maybe more than half. A large percentage. Um, so it's just like, yeah, I don't know, uh, takes a lot of time, but yeah. Yeah. I think like a lot of it's just like figuring out like, okay, like what is this Laplacian thing? Like what's this Laplacian operator would do? It's like, oh, okay. It's the same as convolution. Oh, that's why the blur and tech, that's why that works, right? And you start to like piece together the why a little bit more and then that, you know, but it's definitely a, a journey to like dive into the sort of GLSL for sure. Uh, like I read the book of shaders maybe three or four, three years ago, four years ago. And then I like, was it, I was just like, I don't know what to do with this. So I put it down for a year. And then I like read it again. And then, you know, so it was like a lot of just like having to like piece by piece, like figure out how to use it. Um, no, I don't. Well, I do in the sense that I've taught myself code, but uh, you know, I have more of like a music technology art background and then coming into doing like interactive media. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting question to say like, cause I do have a code background in the sense that I've tried to learn how to, to code, so. <laughs> uh, since like 2014 or 15, so that's around when I learned about it or really started doing doing projects in it, five years or so, yeah.
Yeah. So the, wait, the. I feel. I think that. Uh, with the, use what specifically? Oh, the top. Um. Yeah, I think the you're talking about like edge, the blur edge versus like, or just a different technique. I think that that one that you're looking at was uh, just like de using noise to like deform geometry. You know, I, I think um, I, I just try to explore like as many aspects of the software as I can. That's just, and like, that's part of the daily practice is just to like try to find something different and new as much as possible. Yeah. Oh, uh, I really want to try like, Fisarium, like molds, uh, mold spore stuff. Like, there's a, like a bunch of people who've been doing that, and I really like that. And it's actually like, I think it's a sim it's similar ideas, but um, so I've yet to dive into that. But I'm, some point, yeah. And uh, I don't know. I'm starting to like get into ray uh, ray marching a little bit, but still, like a lot of that stuff for me, it's like I have to really sit and like pour over it to get it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm certainly like far along in certain aspects, but like it, it's just where you dive really. Um, yeah, that's, but I think that's like one that I want to definitely, definitely dive into is the mold for simulations. <laughs> oh, really? Sweet. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. Well, I'll, um, yeah, I'll stick around if people want to ask more questions, but other than that, that's, that's it for this one. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for sticking with it. Like, yeah.